Hi. There's no dry time. Makes us wonder why we booked 15 second ad slots. Dries instantly and keeps you protected for 48 hours. Want more from your shampoo? The Suave Professionals Collection. Infused with the finest ingredients, gently cleanses every day. For salon quality hair you'll love. Get more out of your shampoo with Suave Professionals Collection. Scott Mungie, son of a car wash worker, the oldest of four children in a family that at times lived below the poverty line, put himself through law school. He worked hard seven days a week with no days off and started a law firm from nothing. Scott knows the value of adversity and used it to build a high-powered law firm that wins big for injury clients. Munji and Associates. Call now to find out how much your case is really worth. Right now, you need dependable internet and endless entertainment. Xfinity has you covered with reliably fast speeds, the most in-home Wi-Fi coverage, and advanced security included. Plus, access all your streaming apps in one place, including Peacock. And now, you can get up and running quickly with contactless equipment drop-off. Now that's simple, easy, awesome. Get started with Xfinity for $20 a month for 12 months. Or ask about packages with speed up to a gig. Click or call today. Are you drowning in debt? Struggling just to make minimum payments? It's not your fault. Serious debt can happen to anyone, but there is hope. Our debt-free program has helped thousands of good people, just like you, eliminate their credit card debt. Call us today and we will dramatically reduce your credit card debt down to just a fraction of what you owe. The call is free. The consultation is free. Take control of your credit debt. Take control of your life again. Call now to see how our debt-free program can work for you. Call 800-881-4177. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. A hero truck stolen and taken for a ride leading to a police chase. How the driver tried to stop the accused thief. And high school sports given the okay to start in June. The new rules to keep student athletes safe. And we are covering a lot of stories for you tonight in primetime, including a breakdown of where Georgia stands right now with the coronavirus. We begin with a major development, though, a third arrest in the Ahmad Arbery case in Glynn County. The GBI announced the arrest. Roddy Bryan now also charged with murder and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. He is the third person to be charged in the murder in this case. Investigators say Brian's the one who recorded the video of Travis and Gregory McMichael confronting Arbery in a Brunswick neighborhood in February. It was during that confrontation that he was shot and killed. According to a police report, the McMichaels told officers they thought Arbery was behind recent break-ins in the area, but attorneys for Arbery's family say there is no evidence he ever committed a crime, adding he was unarmed while trying to defend himself against the McMichaels. Both had guns. We are expecting to hear more in this case from the GBI during a news conference tomorrow morning. The other big story tonight, the state vowing to do a better job when it comes to sharing data about where we stand in the battle against the coronavirus. 11 Live's Hope Ford reports from the state capitol. Governor uh, Brian Kemp actually addressed the data reporting errors today, saying his office is committed to transparency and also asked for patience as the Department of Public Health is working to, to put all of the numbers together. Now, at one point, the governor said he's had numerous conversations with Dr. Kathleen Toomey, the rec director of Department of Public Health, about what they need to do to make sure those numbers are reported accurately. And one idea the governor said was being tossed around was actually the idea of reporting the numbers a day later to, uh, to give staff a chance to check the numbers. So let's take a quick listen to uh, Governor Kemp and Dr. Toomey. They were addressing specific steps they're going to take to make sure that all of the data is reported correctly. But just know that every day I'm looking at a lot of different data points that we're getting. We talk about a lot of those every day. There's some things that I see that, you know, we, we don't necessarily talk about a lot. There's a lot of minutia involved in that, but it's very helpful for me to be able to follow uh, those data points. So I think people can be very confident in the decisions that we're making are based on more than just one thing. More feedback, more information, more it, it, within our agency, more communication. 
uh, and uh, a more effort to ensure that it, these data don't just meet our, our needs as epidemiologists, but are presented in a way that the, our, that the public can use. And then also, not just looking at the data that are reported online, they're also looking at the number of hospitalizations. And uh, Governor Kemp said they reached a milestone in Georgia today. Governor Kemp said that there are now less than 1,000 hospitalizations across the state, and that's a drop of about 40 percent since May 1st. More economic fallout at Georgia's hospitals. Emory has now announced it will furlough 1,500 employees. Now, Emory is the largest healthcare system in the state and has been on the front lines of developing a COVID-19 vaccine. Still, our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle report it is facing a $660 million shortfall because of the pandemic. Most surgeries have been canceled, and the CEO says funding from the Federal CARES Act won't cover all of the losses. Wellstar also recently announced it has furloughed more than 1,000 employees. Kroger is moving its hours closer to normal starting on Sunday. Most stores will open at 6 a.m. and close at 11 p.m., but some with fuel location centers will be opening at 5 a.m., and select stores will be open 24 hours. There was a wild chase on the connector today. I don't know if you saw it or not. Somebody stole a hero unit. Joe Hankey has the very latest near Decatur where the chase came to an end. Well, this is how hero trucks are usually used, like this one here, controlling the scene of an accident afterwards. We got traffic backed up in both directions, and this is what it looks like when a hero truck crashes after a police chase. You can see it loaded on the back of that trailer over there. A Georgia State Patrol spokeswoman says this is 19-year-old Vandale Fluker of Decatur being pulled out of a hero unit and arrested. He found himself in handcuffs, according to GSP, after stealing the truck and leading police on a five-mile chase. This man watched it come to an end. When they came out to the expressway, the, the Georgia State Patrol swerved out and, and made a hard swerve in and hit him, and it was over with. The chase began as Atlanta police investigated a crash before 1.30 on the north end of the connector and ran the names of everyone involved. GSP reports officers noticed an outstanding arrest warrant for Fluker and he ran. Nearby, he found a hero unit left running as is standard, according to GSP, when the unit's operator is helping a driver. GSP says Fluker jumped in, the operator tried stopping him, would be dragged a short distance, and left with minor injuries. APD then radioed to GSP, who handled the chase. Georgia State Patrol saying along the way, Fluker slammed into several patrol cars. We have at least seven right now um, that have damage to try to, you know, stop this. Um, he was driving extremely reckless, high rates of speed, ramming anybody they could. Lieutenant Stephanie Stalling says GSP used several pit maneuvers to try to stop the chase, but those would be unsuccessful. When a trooper laid down stop sticks to attempt to blow out the truck's tires, Fluker allegedly swerved at the trooper. The chase eventually came to a rest on Columbia Drive near I-20 without any major injuries. It's extremely fortunate. The, the size of those trucks, they're commercial vehicles. They have a lot of weight behind them, so they can cause a lot of damage and destruction as they're being driven down the road. And Georgia State Patrol troopers tell us Fluker is on his way to the Fulton County Jail, but first he's headed to an area hospital to be checked out for any possible injuries. All right, that is Joe Hankey reporting for us tonight. All right, let's continue to update you now on some of the children's earliest memories will be of their dad battling back from an injury that many thought would end his life. Covington police officer Matt Cooper talked with us about the 20 months since he was shot in the face. He says his family, colleagues, and the community helped him through this traumatic time. Here's Caitlin Ross. There was many days I was broken during my recovery. Like, I, I just didn't think I could do much more, you know, mentally and physically. So I broke down and I started praying again, so like renewed my faith in God. Officer Matt Cooper says his faith and his family got him through his recovery. I always knew Matt was strong. He was a soldier, sniper, and um, I always knew he was strong, but throughout this journey, I've seen a different level of strength than him. Cooper was shot responding to a shoplifting call in September of 2018. The couple's children were just two and four when it happened. It just makes me proud of them and makes me feel like they're going to be able to use this situation in their lives to do good for other people. They admit it's been hard for all of them not to live in fear after such a traumatic injury. We hear like signs like police and fire trucks go off and their lights are going. I'm sure we're just holding their hands like, look, babe, I'm right here, I'm okay. They both say their marriage and family has gotten stronger through Cooper's recovery, though he says he doesn't want to be known for his injury alone. And you know, if something tragic did happen, I'm not going to let it define me as a, as a person, as a man. Right now, he's on administrative duty, working about two hours a day, but eventually he hopes to get back to full time and work in their training department. Tomorrow is Matt Cooper Day, proclaimed by Governor Kemp. The Covington Police Department asking people to send him well wishes 
on the Facebook page toward Officer Cooper as he continues to do better and get stronger, and tomorrow again will be his day of recognition. All new tonight, high school sports in Georgia now have a date that they can return. More on the new rules for student athletes ahead. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough. The Georgia High School Association approved summer workouts to resume June 8th with certain guidelines such as extensive cleaning, no use of locker rooms, and consistent workout groups of no more than 20 to limit exposure. Governor Kemp gave the thumbs up on the plan according to the GHSA. The governor also was on national sports reporter Paul Feinbaum's radio show yesterday talking about college and pro sports opening up. I've talked to President Moorhead at the University of Georgia you know, and other people about what that's going to look like, what they're working on. And, you know, we stand ready to work with them. I think we got to continue to follow the data and the, and the science and the advice of public health officials and see what that's going to look like. I believe it's a little too early to tell whether we're going to, you know, open on Labor Day with a packed house or a sparse crowd or no crowd at all. Governor Kemp said he's spoken with the Falcons, Braves and others and that everybody is dedicated to a safe return. Well, here are three other stories we're following for you tonight. First, Lori Lachlan and Massimo Giannulli will plead guilty to conspiracy charges and serve time in jail. The couple faces charges in connection with the college admissions bribery scheme. They're accused of lying to get their daughters into college as athletes. Now, according to NBC, they will plead guilty to conspiracy to, to commit wire and mail fraud. Lachlan will serve two months in jail. Giannulli will serve five. According to prosecutors, they will be the 23rd and 24th parents to plead guilty in this case. As millions move to online learning, some high school students are suing over their AP exams. A class action lawsuit on behalf of students claims technical glitches block them from submitting their online AP examinations. They're now demanding their work be counted. More than 15,000 to 3 million at-home tests ended with error message, but the executive who oversees the test says they will likely have to retake them. And according to the CDC, the coronavirus is not easily spread just by touching surfaces. The agency released new guidelines. They say, yes, it is possible to get the virus by touching a surface, but it's not the main way. The CDC does say there is still a lot to learn about the virus, and the best form of protection remains social distancing, frequently washing your hands and wearing a mask. President Trump on the road in Michigan and visiting a Ford plant that has found a new way to operate and a new purpose. It comes amid a growing debate over wearing face masks. And the president weighing in today, also today, new unemployment figures showing close to 40 million Americans have filed first-time jobless claims since COVID-19 began. Here's Alice Barr in Washington with the very latest. President Trump visiting Michigan today, touring a Ford plant that's shifted gears to produce ventilators. 
a symbol of the battered American economy in transition. The president saying he would not shut the country down again if there's a second wave of coronavirus cases. We're going to put out the fires. We're not going to close the country. The visit comes against the backdrop of an increasingly heated national debate over wearing masks. One question ahead of this trip, whether the president would wear a mask in public for the first time or go against Michigan state orders and Ford plant policy. Well, I did wear, I had one on before. I wore one in this back area, but I didn't want to give the press the pleasure of seeing it. President so Trump later holding up his mask. Here's my mask right here. And I liked it very much. I actually, honestly, I think I look better in the mask. Ford's top executive deferring to the president. It's up to him. The president and his supporters pointing out he's tested for coronavirus more than any other American. In fact, I was tested this morning. President Trump's visit to Ford, an American manufacturing icon, coming as unemployment figures out today show another unnerving dip. 2.4 million Americans filed new jobless claims last week, bringing the nine-week total to more than 38 million claims. The weekly toll is leveling off, but still represents vast numbers of people who may not get their jobs back. With all 50 states now reopened to some degree, the focus everywhere is on striking a balance between economic and public health. As the country emerges from lockdown, a new study from Columbia University finding if social distancing orders had started just a week earlier, roughly 36,000 fewer Americans may have died. President Trump today called the research a political hit job. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and through the evening hours tonight, most of us are going to stay dry. Uh, there is a chance for a couple of spotty light showers around, but it's not really going to be widespread. This takes us from 9 o'clock until the overnight hours. Now, overnight, on the south side, that's when we're watching some showers and storms that are in Alabama now are going to be moving through the area. Some of those could have some heavy rain, maybe some thunder and lightning with it. We don't think they will be severe, though. This is at 315 in the morning as that activity is moving in south and west of us. And then it moves on over to the east by 5 in the morning in areas like close to Eatonton, north of Macon, maybe through parts of Jasper County there. But not much showing up here in the Atlanta area as far as the heavy rain. I think we'll have just some general showers here as everything moves out for the early morning hours. And then later in the day, there is another chance for some showers and a few thunderstorms to develop. And this time, the main threats are going to be north of I-20. The Storm Prediction Center has put much of that area on the north side in a marginal risk. That's the level one of five risk. The main threats would be damaging winds possible, some lightning, maybe even some small hail in association with some of those showers that develop. However, we don't think it's going to be widespread. Not everybody's going to be getting that heavy rain. Just some of those showers that develop could have some of those strong winds with them. So we're watching temperatures falling this hour from the 70s into the 60s uh, later on during the evening hours, then holding in the 60s overnight. And then it's those early morning hours when we're going to see some of those scattered showers. And yeah, maybe even some thunder showers developing before that next round arrives later on in the afternoon. So we're going with the six on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, kind of mid range there, as it's not going to be a washout. We'll have some dry hours, but then scattered showers. It will be warmer, high temperatures up to 84 degrees. So here's the timeline as we go through the rest of the evening hours tonight. Here we are at 10. Most areas are dry, but it's going to be overnight. Some of those showers coming in on the south side, Light stuff here early in the morning. We'll see some breaks at lunchtime. A few showers, maybe some of those could be heavy at times up in North Georgia at lunchtime. And then in the afternoon, this is that next wave with that southerly flow and the moisture. See how it's not widespread, but some of the ones that develop could be strong at times. Uh, with that damaging wind possible. Those are the main threats. And then during the evening hours, some of those roll through. And then on Saturday, we start off with a few clouds around. The rain chance coming back down on Saturday to about 30%. As you see, not a widespread coverage of showers, but still a few of those spotty showers around. And that's pretty much the same thing for Sunday as well. But look how we warm up. 87 for a high Saturday, 87 Sunday with a 30% chance for showers. On Memorial Day, the rain chance back up to 40% with a high of 84. Still a 40% chance for showers on Tuesday. And then the rain chance is coming back down on Wednesday and Thursday. But it's going to stay warm above average with temperatures in the mid 80s.
In Gwinnett County, deputies and teachers teamed up to make students' summer send-off special. Deputies with the Gwinnett County Sheriff's Office escorted Patrick Elementary School teachers as they drove through their students' neighborhoods wishing them a good and happy summer, also letting them know how much they miss them. Remember, to share the acts of kindness that you see happening in your community, you can let us know all about them on Twitter using the hashtag SendTheLoveATL. And the end of the year always means it's time to honor our graduating seniors. So let's do our senior spotlight. Starting off with Chase Hughes. He is graduating from Hope Academy. He's a member of the National Honor Society, the Beta Club, and captain of the Warriors basketball team. A lot of work there on the court and the classroom. Chase is off to college in the fall to study education and child psychology. We also want to celebrate Sheldon Mills. He is graduating from Newton High School and heading to Durham College in Virginia on a wrestling scholarship. So congratulations to both Chase and Sheldon tonight. A little boy asking a FedEx driver to help deliver something special, a present for his sports idol. A one man's act of kindness led to a, a big surprise. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your. Macy's beginning to open, but shoppers may not recognize the inside. NBC News with an exclusive look inside Macy's here in Atlanta. I believe that is Lenox Square, correct? One of the first welcome back customers uh, is uh, all set to go. You will definitely see social distancing reminders and more workers cleaning high traffic areas. Shoppers will also notice new procedures for dressing rooms. Basically, I can come in, I can try on a dress, but it's not going back on the rack. That's right. We're going to hold it off the floor. So everything that goes into the fitting room, we hold off the floor, we segregate it, and then put it out at a later date. Some of the biggest changes at the makeup counter, you cannot test it out. Keep your uh, hands to yourself when it comes to <laughs> using those spray bottles. Workers will now suggest the right shade of foundation, even coloring it on a piece of paper for you. About a quarter of Macy's stores have reopened across the United States. It was a thoughtful idea, but a real long shot. A FedEx driver in our town wanted to help out a little boy in Sewanee connect with an athlete he looks up to. Yeah, a lot of folks talking about this when it all turned out to be bigger and better than he ever hoped. Our Elwin Lopez spoke with that family today.
Mikkel tells me he just joined TikTok a few months ago to keep a watchful eye on his 12 year old daughter's account. He says he didn't expect to get the following he currently has, much less to make a huge impact on a young boy's life. Hello, hello. What's up, guys? How are you? Tony. What? Hey, you got, how do you guys, are you living in a sideways world? That's crazy. <laughs> Camera upside down and all. Six year old Cooper and his nine year old brother Tucker are meeting their idol skateboard legend Tony Hawk for the first time. Here's my skate park. Dude, you're lucky. You're lucky. None of this would have been possible if it weren't for one person. It started with Cooper and uh, Mikhail was the was the glue. On Tuesday, Mikhail Farrar was in Swanee on his delivery route for FedEx. I'm about to make a turn and I see this little boy running behind my truck and all of a sudden I hear, excuse me, excuse me. And I'm like, what is that? It was six year old Cooper. He wasn't even wearing shoes, nothing. He just ran him down the street. All Cooper wanted was to get his old skateboard to his idol. Hey, sir, do you know the pro skater Tony Hawk? I was like, yeah, I know who he is. He goes, can you mail this to him? And this is what it was. He says, get this to Tony Hawk for me. Uh, tell him it's from Cooper and I just thought it was adorable. That TikTok video posted by Mikkel made its way to Hawk. People were tagging me and texting me and they're like, you gotta see this video, you gotta see this video. And he responded with one of his own. Hey Cooper, what's up, it's Tony Hawk and I just wanna say thank you so much for the skateboard. It's on its way to my house already and uh, as a thank you gift, I'm gonna send you my skateboard, this one right here that I'm riding. Today, not only did Cooper get his skateboard, but Hawk also made sure his brother got one too. Hey, Cooper, you didn't really expect me to send you anything, did you? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you did? Oh, you well, did? I stand corrected. <laughs> Mikkel says even though he's been making deliveries in Cooper's neighborhood of Swanee for over two years, that they had not really met until now, and as you can imagine, they've become fast friends. Well, we have heard the governor say it time and time again, anyone who wants a COVID-19 test can get one, whether they have symptoms or not. But we're still hearing from people who say that's not the case. What our reveal investigators found when they checked it out. Next. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a Two weeks ago, the state announced that all Georgians should get tested for coronavirus, symptoms or not. The state reports more than 404,000 tests have now been processed. Still, we get emails all the time from people who say that they or their loved one wants a test, but they are unable to do so. Reveal Chief Investigator Brendan Keefe set out to see if anyone who wants a test really can get one. <sighs> What's that? Have you registered yet? Yes, I uh, have a reservation number here. My test for the COVID-19 virus is waiting in this Alpharetta parking lot, but the road to get here was paved with denials, delays, and dollars. It's a vicious cycle. Call here, call here, call here, call here. That was mid-March. I'm calling to see how I could get tested for COVID-19. When diagnostic testing still required symptoms and recent travel to a foreign country. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. Are they telling the truth? Nope, that's false. If we're not testing people with symptoms, we don't have a handle on just how serious and widespread this is? Absolutely. Um, I don't think the numbers that are being reported can even reflect what's really going on if everyday people can't get tested. Governor Kemp changed all that two months later as the state opened more testing sites. Encouraging all Georgians, even if they are not experiencing symptoms, to schedule an appointment. I first went to the free CVS testing site at Georgia Tech. The website still pre-screens people based on symptoms, none of which I have. In all three tries over the last week, the system replied, you do not qualify for testing at this time. Let's take a closer look at the coronavirus. As we zoom in, there's that familiar shape. But let's go inside the virus to see what the diagnostic tests are actually looking for. It's these blue strands right here. This is RNA. These are the nucleic acids that are essentially the genetic fingerprint of the virus. That's not what the blood tests are looking for. Those are looking for the antibodies that your immune system produces to hunt down the virus in your body and destroy it. I was able to get antibody testing at Quest Diagnostics. The blood test has no prerequisites other than you can't be sick and you must be willing to pay $129 for the retail test. But the results 24 hours later don't tell you if you're currently infected, only that you've previously been infected and now have the antibodies. Or get a screening through the AU Health Express Care app. So I downloaded the state's app from Augusta Health and was screened for symptoms. No, I have no conditions at all. Just wanted to get the test since the governor had mentioned okay. that uh, okay. everyone should get tested. Yeah, that was the our governor recommended. So here's here the thing that I want you to understand: since you you don't have symptoms, you're very, you are in a very low risk category um, for for having complication if you get infected. CDC guidelines do not recommend you to get a test, but you insist. I can I can register for you. However, that comes with the cost for the COVID nineteen test. I see. How much How much is it? About three hundred dollars something. than what I heard. Three hundred dollars. Okay. The governor's office insists there is no cost for COVID testing, but the nurse practitioner on the state's app suggested it's not worth it for asymptomatic Georgians. Practicing uh, social distancing, washing your hands, and those kinds of things would be very very effective, cost effective. All right, so we're a minute and a half into the call to the Fulton County Board of Health, and it's just repeating a recording saying it's the COVID hotline. My county health department, also recommended by the governor, booked my free test for the next day, no questions asked. Okay, even though I don't have symptoms, I can get in there without a charge. All right, the results are coming back in about five days. Got it. When I got to the Alpharetta testing site Saturday morning, the parking lot was nearly empty. The National Guard not letting anyone in without a reservation. I saw only one other patient. 
You guys are the real heroes in this, I'll tell you. The whole test was over in seconds. All right, go ahead. Only five seconds, okay? okay? You can do this. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. That's all that. Oh, wow. Unlike the government backed CBS testing I didn't qualify for, which returns results in minutes, I won't know if I was positive last Saturday until days later. President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, is out of prison and back home in New York City. It's one of three things you need to know right now. Cohen will serve the rest of his three-year sentence in home confinement because of the coronavirus pandemic. He served about 10 months at a federal prison in New York. Cohen pleaded guilty to lying to Congress about President Trump's business in Russia, tax fraud, and campaign finance fraud. Michigan's governor has strong words for President Trump. This comes after he threatened to withhold federal funding if the state continues to pursue mass in-person voting. Threatening to take money away from a state that is hurting as bad as we are right now is just uh, scary and I think is something that is unacceptable. And that threat was about mass mail-in voting. Governor Gretchen Whitmire appeared on CBS News this morning. She says the president's threats to pull funding are ridiculous, scary, and a major distraction. The president claims mail-in ballots lead to fraud. Yesterday, he tweeted false claims that Michigan was sending absentee ballots to 7.7 .7 million voters. The president later corrected his tweet to refer to absentee ballot applications. And the TSA is implementing some new procedures to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 during screenings. The agency is encouraging social distancing and wearing facial coverings to the checkpoints. The TSA also wants passengers to hold on to their boarding passes instead of handing them over to officers. These changes are already starting at airports across the country, but more will be widespread by mid-June. As the country begins to come back online, there is one group that millions are still looking for guidance from. Houses of worship haven't had any federal recommendations on how to reopen, but today the president says new guidelines are on the way. Here's NBC's Jay Gray. As the lights come back on in businesses across the country, restaurants, gyms, and retail outlets, even bars. We've removed half our chairs in the bar, half the tables. Are getting guidance from the Centers for Disease Control. But to this point, there have been no federal recommendations for places of worship. The president and CDC reportedly at odds over the issue. I want to get our churches open, and we're going to take a very strong position on that very soon. An administration official telling NBC News the White House plans to release recommendations for churches, synagogues, and mosques in the next week to 10 days. But for now, states, or in some cases, faith leaders themselves, are mapping out the way forward. You're going to go to Walmart, Target today? Let's go to church today. In some places, though, filling the pews has caused problems. Like Holy Ghost Parish in Houston, this church closed down again after a priest died from COVID-19. More than 100 parishioners are in quarantine. In Palermo, California, close to 200 churchgoers may have been exposed to the virus, a congregant testing positive after attending a Mother's Day service. Millions across the nation. We're excited to be together. Trying to navigate what is a blurry line right now between faith and infection. Tonight, we are starting to get a glimpse at the Metro Atlanta restaurants that were forced to buckle in the pandemic. Yeah, while Governor Kemp tried to reignite our economy by being one of the first to reopen, some restaurant owners say it did more harm than good. And Tisha Lance has more. I'm struggling to try to make sense of all of this. For 10 years, Will Turner worked to make his dream happen, turning his highly successful food truck into a freestanding sit-down restaurant on Peachtree Industrial. This week, the place he filled with his passion was wiped out by COVID-19. The 10 years of, of working for something and then getting it and then to have it taken away at no fault of your own, um, that's a hard pill to swallow. The restaurant industry as a whole, uh, it's a very difficult business. When an event like this hits, it could be devastating. That was the case for one of Lucky's Burger and Brew locations in Emory Village. The virus accelerated the decline of a restaurant already struggling. When COVID hit, uh, it, and they basically sent all the students home. It really became untenable over there. As of last month, nearly 6 million restaurant jobs have been lost. For small business owners struggling to pay their bills, expected relief from reopening may have hurt more. When the governor officially opened the state back up, that kind of changed the mindset of the creditors, the vendors, and the landlord. And it shifted from, we'll work with you, to 
uh, we need our money now. Turner says 90% of his customers worked near his restaurant. Without them fully back in the office, his seats remained empty. Well, tomorrow, Vice President Mike Pence will meet with restaurant executives in Atlanta. They're uh, pressed, or they have rather pressed the president to extend the deadline for spending those PPP loans from eight weeks to 24 weeks. And while the president called the request reasonable, it's not clear how much of an extension will be given. Unfortunately, the list keeps growing of how many Metro Atlanta restaurants are now closed. You can read the full list that we have gathered for you in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. This next story will warm your heart. A sixth grader wanted to find a way to show his appreciation for Decatur medical workers through music. And Jeff, folks, you might say he hit a really high note with this one. Oh, yes, I think you might say that indeed. And he has been a very dedicated person, too. Hope Ford shows us the 12 year old continued his nightly performance for almost a month straight. Twelve-year-old Jason Zagans is a passionate young man. I'll sometimes be playing Fortnite with my friends and say, it's time to go to the hospital, bye. Jason goes to Emory Healthcare in Decatur every night, not because he's sick, but to play for healthcare workers during shift change. The one-man band comes with an impressive set list. Over the rainbow, America the beautiful, my country tis of thee. And he's lined up dedicated fans. When's the album coming out? <laughs> Robert Westmoreland can't wait for 7 p.m. when Jason stands in the middle of the hospital grounds so his music can bounce all around. It's like a vitamin, like the extra boost, like, hey, we can do it. It made me feel really good to know that I hadn't have a fan at least once. One fan. <laughs> he has more than one. With a hectic work schedule since the pandemic, workers are happy Jason is now a part of their routine. We leave, we talk about it in the lunchroom, like, hey, did you see the little guy out there playing? Even the birds join his outdoor performance. Jason will keep coming back for the foreseeable future, playing his songs of appreciation. He says, why not do something you love while sending love to those in need? It's really fun, makes people happy. And if you like doing it, then you're happy too. Music runs in the family. Jason's father plays for the ASO, the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra. Jason has said his dream is to play in the orchestra with his father right next to him. That's so sweet. It's great. A vacancy coming to Georgia's high court. Coming up, why Governor Kemp gets the final say instead of voters. Prank. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, 
and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Georgia Sperm Bank faced tough questions today from the state Supreme Court after a family accused it of selling sperm under false pretenses. The family says they were told the donor had multiple college degrees and a clean medical history. Well, neither of that turned out to be true. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom says at issue now is whether that family can sue. Several families who purchased sperm from this donor have tried to sue. As the attorney told the Supreme Court justices, 10 judges have already dismissed these cases because in Georgia, you can't sue for wrongful birth. May it please the court. The hearing was held virtually. Justices lined up to listen as each side had 20 minutes to make their case. The, the family at the center of it all sat in their living room to watch. A sperm bank should exercise reasonable care. An issue is whether selling misrepresented sperm counts as consumer fraud or wrongful birth, a term that came out of a 1990 court case involving the Abelson family. The result, you can't sue for failure to be notified your child will be born with a defect. You say the child didn't turn out the way you wanted. How is that different from the doctor failing to diagnose your child with Down syndrome? But the issue that seemed to frustrate the justices. Your resistance is alarming. Was the idea that understand. if this case was dismissed as a wrongful birth claim, Zytex could do or say anything about the sperm it sold and never be held accountable. Seems like because we're dealing with sperm and we have this Abelson case, you are now exempt from all civil remedies, all theories, no matter what kind of conduct your client may have engaged in. That can't be right. 38 law professors from across the United States also filed this legal analysis, asking the justices to allow the Normans case, as well as others like it, to go to trial. It could take up to six months before we learn their decision. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. You know, we have already had one tropical storm this year before hurricane season even starts. It's supposed to start on June 1st, but this is the sixth year in a row that we've had a uh, tropical system develop before June. So that's not that ne necessarily out of the ordinary, but NOAA today released their preseason uh, outlook for hurricane season, and they are still saying that it looks like it's going to be an above average season for tropical storm activity. Now, they are forecasting 13 to 19 named storms, and on average, we would have about 12 of those. As far as hurricanes, on average, we would see six, but they're predicting six to 10, and they're also predicting that three to six of those could be major storms at category three or above. Now, the problem is with this is we don't know yet where they're going to go. Many of these storms could stay out in the ocean. We don't we can't predict how many of them are going to make landfall, but there will be a lot of activity in the Atlantic Basin, we think, as we go through the hurricane season. Now, today here, our temperatures warmed up. Remember yesterday we were only at 65 degrees for a high. Today, we were 10 degrees warmer, 75 degrees was our high temperature, but that is still below the average, six degrees below average. We should be at 81 for this time of year. We didn't pick up any rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson, but tomorrow we will have a chance for some rain and maybe even the potential for some stronger storms, especially on the north side. Now tonight, 
Overnight, we're watching some showers and storms that'll move through on the south side. And then later in the afternoon tomorrow, on the north side is the time frame when we're going to see a few scattered showers that'll move through. Some of those could turn strong. It's not going to be widespread, but just the scattered showers that could have damaging winds, lightning, maybe some small hail in association with that. So on the wasometer, we're going to go with a 6. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Lows kind of mild at 64, and then we get up to 84 in the afternoon, which is going to be above average for this time of year. This evening, we're looking fine. You can see at the 10 o'clock hour, just a few clouds around, but no real widespread rain. Overnight, we're going to see some showers and storms rolling through on the south side. In the morning, the potential for a couple of lingering showers here. We'll see a break in the action, we think, at noontime, around lunchtime, with some showers up in North Georgia that could have some heavy rain with them. And then in the afternoon tomorrow, with some moisture in place, the southerly flow, you see how this isn't really widespread? It's just going to be some scattered showers around. However, the ones that develop could be strong with some of those damaging winds. And some of that lingers into the evening hours. And then it gets a little bit better here on Saturday with um, uh, nicer weather here, a few clouds around, and the rain chance is a little lower at only 30% on Saturday. So through the weekend, 30% chance for showers warming to 87. 84, though, Monday and Tuesday. On Memorial Day, the rain chance back up to 40%. And then lower rain chances Wednesday and Thursday with temperatures staying above average around 84 on Tuesday, 85 on Wednesday and Thursday. Cracking down on Atlanta street racing problem by opening up a racetrack to everybody. More on the new proposal involving the Atlanta Motor Speedway coming up. Ease. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick cover your cough or sneeze.
Illegal street racing in Atlanta has become a major problem. Over the weekend, police arrested 44 people and impounded 29 cars. But now Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is exploring solutions to allow street racing to be done legally and maybe safely. Videos like this one have been shared all over social media over the past few months. And today during city council meeting, Mayor Bottoms announced the city is looking to identify designated areas or streets specifically for racing. Bottom says she understands the culture behind it and even says the Atlanta Motor Speedway could be a possible venue. It's just an idea being thrown out right now, but according to Mayor Bottoms, there's more to it than just picking a location. If we were able to find a location, what the liability would be, what the parameters would be. So I don't even know if that's going to be an option, but it's just one thing that we're benchmarking and, and looking to see if, um, if that's something that would help alleviate it, but it would not be in anyone's neighborhood or on any public streets. I can assure you of that. The move is still under consideration for now. Though street racing in Atlanta is very illegal and Atlanta police say they will continue to arrest anyone who is involved. Elections involving Georgia Supreme Court justices don't always get a lot of attention statewide, but in these very tough political times, it is a non-election that now is making headlines. Justice Keith Blackwell is stepping down from the bench in November. According to the court, the Georgia Constitution says the governor appoints the replacement. The Supreme Court stepped in because of two lawsuits. Former Democratic Congressman John Barrow and former Republican State Representative Beth Beskin sued the Secretary of State, claiming an election should be held. They both wanted to run for it, arguing that justices should be elected. Both Fulton County Superior Court and the Georgia Supreme Court disagreed, saying in a case like this, the governor ultimately makes the appointment. We asked attorney and law professor Randy Kessler if the court got this one right. You know, it's a close call because there are two provisions. One, we want judges to be elected, but the governor has the right to appoint them when it's an expiring term. Had Blackwell resigned and said, I'm leaving now, then there would have been an election. But he says I'm not resigning until November. But the, the short version is I think the Supreme Court got it right. And I don't think it was political. The governor has not yet announced his pick to replace Justice Blackwell. Major news in the Ahmaud Arbery case. The man who shot the cell phone video has been arrested and charged with felony murder. More on this development ahead in primetime. <laughs> Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. 
on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Today, the GHSA voted to allow schools to resume sports activities beginning at June 8th at the discretion of the school system. Here's a look at some, not all, of the guidelines that the schools will need to follow. Athletes will be asked about their health and exposure to COVID-19. Workout groups will be limited to 20 consistent athletes at a time, and there will be time and resources for disinfecting. The board decided to move the date from the 1st to the 8th, so schools, players, and coaches have more time to prepare to follow the guidelines. We will have more details and reactions coming up tonight. We continue to congratulate the class of 2020. Tonight, we honor Riverwood High School. Hello, my name is Michael Mezio. I'm the athletic director at Riverwood High School. So ultimately, I want to thank the class of 2020 uh, for all their hard work and their dedication for Riverwood Athletics. We were having a fantastic year at Riverwood High School. It was looking pretty good for them too have a number of region champions. I started as a, a basketball coach. In those situations, it was like all about competition. But as athletic director, I realized that community was, is really what it's about. Our students sticking together, sticking with their community, with the help of coaches sometimes, Zoom senior nights and uh, banquets. And then once, you know, the shelter in place was lifted, the, the seniors realized it was more about community than competition as well. And they organized some, you know, unofficial, meetings, of course, practicing social distancing, just to get together with their teammates. That's why sports are so important. The life skills it teach, the, the relationships that the students build, and the fact that they continue to carry that on, it really does make you proud. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. We're covering many stories on this Thursday night, including a breakdown of where Georgia stands with the coronavirus. But we begin with a major development, a third arrest in the Ahmad Arbery case, the GBI announcing the arrest. Roddy Bryan now also charged with murder and criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. He's now the third person to be charged with murder in the case. Investigators say Bryan is the one who recorded the video of Travis and Gregory McMichael confronting Arbery with a shotgun in a Brunswick neighborhood, Glynn County, back in February. It was during the confrontation that Arbery was shot twice and killed. According to a police report, the McMichaels told officers they thought Arbery was behind recent break-ins in the area. But attorneys for Arbery's family say there's no evidence he committed a crime, adding he was unarmed while trying to defend himself against the McMichaels, who both had guns. We are expecting to hear from the GBI on the case during a news conference tomorrow morning. The other big story, the state is vowing to do a better job when it comes to sharing data, information about where we stand in the battle against coronavirus. 11 Alive's Hope Ford reports from the state capitol. Governor uh, Brian Kemp actually addressed the data reporting errors today, saying his office is committed to transparency and also asked for patience as the Department of Public Health is working to, to put all of the numbers together. Now, at one point, the governor said he's had numerous conversations with Dr. Kathleen Toomey, the rec director of the Department of Public Health, about what they need to do to make sure those numbers are reported accurately. And one idea the governor said was being tossed around was actually the idea of reporting the numbers a day later to, uh, to give staff a chance to check the numbers. So let's take a quick listen to uh, Governor Kemp and Dr. Toomey. They were addressing specific steps they're going to take to make sure that all of the data is reported correctly. But just know that every day I'm looking at a lot of different data points that we're getting. We talk about a lot of those every day. There's some things that I see that, you know, we, we don't necessarily talk about a lot. There's a lot of minutia involved in that, but it's very helpful for me to be able to follow uh, those data points. So I think people can be very confident in the decisions that we're making are based on more than just one thing. More feedback, more information, more it, it, within our agency, more communication, uh, and uh, more effort to ensure that it, these data don't just meet our, our needs as epidemiologists, but are presented in a way that the, our, that the public can use. 
And they're also not just looking at the data that are reported online, they're also looking at the number of hospitalizations. And uh, Governor Kim said they reached a milestone in Georgia today. Governor Kim said that there are now less than 1,000 hospitalizations across the state, and that's a drop of about 40 percent since May 1st. Once again, the numbers are in the news. The Department of Public Health now says that that number of total tests they always put on their website includes both those performed to determine if someone currently has COVID-19 and at least 57,000 antibody tests, which are seen as an indicator of past infection. Epidemiologist Harry Hyman says these are not the same thing and they should not be grouped together. When you throw antibody test results and not just a few hundred or a few thousand, but 60,000 over a number of weeks into the total number of tests, it's, it's very misleading, both about our capacity for doing acute viral testing, but also about kind of surveillances, if you will, in the, in the state. Putting these tests all in the same spot kind of skews all the reports that have come out of the governor's office recently. Well, good afternoon, everyone. He has consistently pointed to the percentage of positive cases to total tests to show that things are getting better. Last Friday, he celebrated a new benchmark, 300,000 tests completed, which he said amounted to 3.3% of the state's population. It was after that announcement that I asked the governor's office if they had taken into consideration that hospital patients are usually given the test multiple times and some employers require another test before returning to work. I received no response. I also reached out to the Department of Public Health to get some better context around the massive and seemingly overnight jump in numbers. They did respond but said nothing about antibody testing. Even more troubling, when the head of DPH was questioned on Wednesday, she admitted the information was misleading. And here's why that's a problem. Number one, the numbers are artificial. And so we're artificially inflating the total numbers, making that percent positive look better. Uh, number two is we have appropriately rapidly ramped up our testing in the state. As you ramp up testing and test more people, um, who are not sick, who are not symptomatic, or who are mildly symptomatic, people that didn't have access to the test before, you would absolutely expect your percent positivity rate to go down. The reality is we have no way to independently verify the data provided by the state, but it is exactly because we are asking these questions that problems with the data are being found and fixed. The state now says it will put these two types of tests into different categories that is yet to happen, and we plan to continue asking why. Despite its groundbreaking work on COVID-19, Emory is now facing a $660 million revenue shortfall. That's why the state's largest healthcare system will be furloughing 1,500 workers. That's according to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Most of those losses are due to the number of non-emergency surgeries and other procedures put on hold by coronavirus. Those totals exceed the $142 million that Emory received from the Federal CARES Act. Furloughs, reduced work hours, and other cost-cutting measures will begin on June 1st. The Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, will make a stop in Georgia tomorrow. He will be in Atlanta. He will meet with Governor Kemp for lunch to discuss how Georgia's reopening has gone. The VP is expected to take part in a roundtable discussion. The meeting is scheduled with restaurant industry leaders, and it is set to happen at the Waffle House headquarters in Norcross. You might remember Waffle House was slow to close its restaurants. In fact, they are known for staying open, even in the face of natural disasters and other tough conditions. Early on the pandemic, the company said it was working to keep as many locations open as possible to support its employees. The CEO took part in a White House meeting about reopening the country. Later, they were among the first to make adjustments and get back to business in Georgia, getting some attention from Governor Kemp for their efforts as well. Georgia also seeing some political attention from the other side of the aisle today. Former second lady, Dr. Jill Biden, is holding several virtual events today with Georgians. Earlier, she met online with frontline workers and educators in two separate events, and a third virtual event took place this evening with Atlanta's mayor. So 
you are who you are with and maybe not with what you touch. It may be the key to how coronavirus is spread. Uh, updated guidance from the CDC says the virus does not spread easily from objects or surfaces, although it's still possible you could contract it that way. But it's more likely to pass from person to person. Experts still say the best protection is social distancing, hand washing and wearing masks. All right, let's check in with our weather right now. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb with us tonight. Yeah, Jeff, you know, I'm on uh, Facebook Live right now. More than 300 people. That's why my phone is right here in the shot. We are talking about weather that we're expecting tonight. And uh, the, a lot of folks are wanting the temperatures to warm up for the weekend. Because, you know, this weekend, Memorial Day weekend, kind of the unofficial start of summertime. And let me tell you, it is going to start feeling more like summertime as we're going to be in the mid 80s this weekend, even some upper 80s in some spots. For tonight, most areas are quiet. We've had just a couple of spotty little showers up in North Georgia, not really causing any issues there. Most of us are dry here in Atlanta. Still watching that area of low pressure cut off, uh, centered up to our north. That's going to slowly drift away most of the heavier shower activity into the Carolinas. Now, earlier tonight, I was talking about this activity uh, down in Alabama with some thunder and lightning near Montgomery. Earlier, some of our high resolution models were showing that some of this could skirt just south of Atlanta and stay south of I-20. I really think now that most of this tonight is going to be even more down to the south, most likely south of the Macon area. Just don't be surprised for some of you uh, on the south side that you can see a couple of spotty showers around. In fact, here's the future radar product. Let me walk you through the evening hours and you see just a couple of spotty showers on the north side. Here we are at 315 and there you can see really Macon to Columbus southward is where we're going to see a better chance for those more moderate to heavy showers. Still a couple of scattered showers there south of I-20, so not a lot to worry about with that overnight. But tomorrow we will see more scattered showers developing and even though it's not going to be widespread, some of those showers that develop could turn strong. We're going to break down the low risk for severe weather over parts of North Georgia and talk more about that timing for you coming up in just a few minutes. Tomorrow is Officer Matt Cooper Day in Georgia. His loved ones feel like it should be every day after the way he has fought his way back. Officer Cooper shot in the head 20 months ago. Caitlin Ross reports on a recovery that his family calls miraculous. There was many days I was broken during my recovery. Like I, I just didn't think I could do much more, you know, mentally and physically. So I broke down and I started praying again. So like renewed my faith in God. Officer Matt Cooper says his faith and his family got him through his recovery. I always knew Matt was strong. He was a soldier, sniper, and um, I always knew he was strong, but throughout this journey, I've seen a different level of strength in him. Cooper was shot responding to a shoplifting call in September of 2018. The couple's children were just two and four when it happened. It just makes me proud of them and makes me feel like they're going to be able to use this situation in their lives to do good for other people. They admit it's been hard for all of them not to live in fear after such a traumatic injury. We hear like signs like police and fire trucks go off and their lights are going I'm just hold her hands like, look, babe, I'm right here, I'm okay. They both say their marriage and family has gotten stronger through Cooper's recovery, though he says he doesn't want to be known for his injury alone. And you know, if something tragic didn't happen, I'm not going to let it define me as a, as a person, as a man. Right now, he's on administrative duty, working about two hours a day, but eventually he hopes to get back to full time and work in their training department. <laughs> It is a great story of recovery, my goodness. All right, coming up, a special delivery, a skateboard, a superstar, a boy, and a heroic delivery man. All of that coming together in Atlanta Metro. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. 
because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. It was a thoughtful idea, but a real long shot. A FedEx driver in Georgia, in suburban Atlanta, in Gwinnett County, wanted to help out a little boy connect with an athlete that he looks up to. And it turned out bigger and better than he possibly could have imagined. Here's Elvin Lopez. Mikkel tells me he just joined TikTok a few months ago to keep a watchful eye on his 12-year-old daughter's account. He says he didn't expect to get the following he currently has, much less to make a huge impact on a young boy's life. Hello, hello. What's up, guys? How are you? Tony. What? Hey, you got, how do you guys, are you living in a sideways world? That's crazy. <laughs> Camera upside down and all. Six-year-old Cooper and his nine-year-old brother, Tucker, are meeting their idol, skateboard legend Tony Hawk, for the first time. Here's my skate park. Dude, you're lucky. You're lucky. None of this would have been possible if it weren't for one person. It started with Cooper. And uh, Mikkel was the was the glue. On Tuesday, Mikkel Farrar was in Swanee on his delivery route for FedEx. Yeah, I'm about to make a turn, and I see this little boy running behind my truck, and all of a sudden I hear, "Excuse me, excuse me," and I'm like, "What is that?" It was six-year-old Cooper. He wasn't even wearing shoes, nothing. He just ran him down the street. All Cooper wanted was to get his old skateboard to his idol. Hey, sir, do you know the pro skater Tony Hawk? I was like, "Yeah, I know who he is." He goes, can you mail this to him? And this is what it was. He says, get this to Tony Hawk for me. Uh, tell him it's from Cooper. And I just thought it was adorable. That TikTok video posted by Mikkel made its way to Hawk. People were tagging me and texting me. And they're like, you got to see this video. You got to see this video. And he responded with one of his own. Hey, Cooper, what's up? It's Tony Hawk. And I just want to say thank you so much for the skateboard. It's on its way to my house already. And uh, as a thank you gift, I'm going to send you my skateboard. This one right here that I'm riding. Today, not only did Cooper get his skateboard, but Hawk also made sure his brother got one, too. Hey, Cooper, you didn't really expect me to send you anything, did you? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you did? Uh, you well, did? I stand corrected. <laughs> Mikkel says even though he's been making deliveries in Cooper's neighborhood of Swanee for over two years, that they had not really met until now. And as you can imagine, they've become fast friends. A great story, in fact, a wonderful story about Tony Hawk, who's been such a superstar in the world of athletics for so many years now in his early 50s. And uh, it is uh, quite a saga. All right, the couple facing charges in connection with the, uh, the scam to try to get their child into a better university is one of the many stories that we are following right now. Lori Laughlin and her husband will plead guilty to conspiracy charges and they will go to jail. A couple facing charges in connection with a college admissions bribery scheme. They're accused of lying to get their daughter into college as athletes. They weren't athletes. According to NBC, they will plead guilty to conspiracy to commit wire and mail fraud. Laughlin will get two months her husband gets five. For anyone who has children trying to get into a good school, this story stirs our boat. According to prosecutors, there will be uh, 20, they will be the 23rd and 24th parents to plead guilty in this case. As millions move to online learning, some high school students are suing over their AP exams, a class action lawsuit on behalf of students claiming that technical glitches block them from submitting their online AP exams. Now, they are demanding their work be counted. More than 15,000 of the 3 million at home tests ended with error messages, but the executive who oversees the test says they'll likely have to retake them. According to the CDC, the coronavirus not easily spread by touching surfaces. The agency released new guidelines. They say, yes, it is possible to get the virus by touching a surface, but it's not the main way. The CDC does say there is still a lot to learn about the virus and the best form of protection remains social distancing, frequently washing your hands and wearing a mask. President Trump on the road in Michigan today visiting a Ford plant. 
that has found a new way to operate and a new purpose. It comes amid a growing debate over wearing face masks. The president weighing in today. Also today, new unemployment figures show close to 40 million Americans have filed first-time jobless claims since the coronavirus began. Here's Alice Barr. President Trump visiting Michigan today, touring a Ford plant that's shifted gears to produce ventilators, a symbol of the battered American economy in transition. The president saying he would not shut the country down again if there's a second wave of coronavirus cases. We're going to put out the fires. We're not going to close the country. The visit comes against the backdrop of an increasingly heated national debate over wearing masks. One question ahead of this trip, whether the president would wear a mask in public for the first time or go against Michigan state orders and Ford plant policy. Well, I did wear, I had one on before. I wore one in this back area, but I didn't want to give the press the pleasure of seeing it. President so Trump later holding up his mask. Here's my mask right here. And I liked it very much. I actually, honestly, I think I look better in the mask. Ford's top executive deferring to the president. It's up to him. The president and his supporters pointing out he's tested for coronavirus more than any other American. In fact, I was tested this morning. President Trump's visit to Ford, an American manufacturing icon, coming as unemployment figures out today show another unnerving dip. 2.4 million Americans filed new jobless claims last week, bringing the nine-week total to more than 38 million claims. The weekly toll is leveling off, but still represents vast numbers of people who may not get their jobs back. With all 50 states now reopened to some degree, the focus everywhere is on striking a balance between economic and public health. As the country emerges from lockdown, a new study from Columbia University found that if social distancing orders had started just a week earlier, 36,000 fewer Americans may, have, die, may uh, have, have not died. President Trump today called the research a political hit job. Chris. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, once again with you in the uh, basement Storm Tracker Center. And as we are social distancing still, and, and, and we've got about 200, we had over 300 people on a little bit earlier. I think we even got up close to 400 people on Facebook Live. So that's why my phone is here in the shot, as I'm talking to you on TV, as well as folks on Facebook Live. And um, in fact, Ursula asked, said that her kids were camping in Jasper, Georgia, and hoping that they're not going to get any rain. And I think they'll be fine for tonight. Ursula, I'm talking to Ursula on Facebook Live and to all of you, as we have mainly dry weather conditions here now. And we've only seen a couple little spotty light showers around this evening, and that was mainly up in North Georgia. We're still watching that area of low pressure. All right, it's that cutoff low uh, that is up to our north. That's slowly drifting away. Most of the heavier showers are in the Carolinas. And then earlier tonight, we were talking about uh, those showers coming out of Alabama. And the earlier high-resolution models were showing that coming across just south of the city. Now it looks like that's not going to have a push to the north and east. It's pretty much going to stay down to the south tonight, really between Columbus and Macon. So on the south side of Atlanta during the overnight hours, I wouldn't be surprised if you have some scattered showers, but I don't think it's going to be anything heavy. That heavier stuff is going to be more down to the south. In fact, here's that future radar, uh, the high resolution radar that I'm talking about. And this is by 315 in the morning. And instead of that being just south of I-20, it's keeping more of the moderate and heavy rain down on the south side. So I really think that's where it's going to stay tonight. Just a couple of scattered showers here. And then as we get toward the early morning hours, when some of you may be getting up, heading out to work, or if you're not, if you are working at the office and have to get out early in the morning, and there'll be a few scattered showers around early on. This is at 1015, a few spotty showers, and then we'll be watching this coming out of North Alabama, moving across North Georgia. And that's why we have this green over a, a big part of North Georgia. That's from the Storm Prediction Center. And they are saying that much of North Georgia will be in that dark green color, which is a level one of five risk for some stronger storms. What does that mean? Mainly only isolated stronger storms. I don't think it's going to be very widespread at all, uh, but the ones that develop could be strong with damaging winds, lightning, maybe some small hail with that, and some pockets of heavy rain. But it's not going to be widespread, not a widespread severe weather event or anything like that. Now, our temperatures today warmed up. We got up to 75 today, 10 degrees warmer than we were yesterday when we were at 65 for a high. Right now, we're still at 70. 
Upper 60s over most of Metro Atlanta. We got mid 60s in Carrollton, 63 in Covington, lower 60s up in Blairsville and Clayton as well. Through the nighttime hours, we'll pretty much be in those mid 60s here. And by tomorrow morning, that's when we'll see some of those scattered showers that'll develop. We're going to go with a six on the wasometer tomorrow. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect 11 alive day. Going with that six, a low of 64 and a high of 84. So tomorrow, even warmer than we were today. Here's the timeline. Some of those scattered showers early in the morning, but that's not going to be the, the stronger stuff. But afternoon and evening is when we see these showers that'll move through North Georgia and even some of those here in Metro Atlanta during the evening hours. And as I said, it's not really widespread, but those that develop could be strong. 84 for a high Friday, 87 Saturday, also 87 Sunday. So there's that warmer air and the rain chance down to 30%. Back to a 40% chance for showers Monday and Tuesday. And then the rain chance is going down Wednesday and Thursday. Temperatures stay warm though through the period, even into next week. We'll see highs in the mid 80s. Stay with us. We have much more to come on 11 Alive Primetime. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact. There was a wild chase on the connector today after somebody stole a hero unit. Joe Hankey, the very latest, and he reports from Decatur where the chase came to an end. Well, this is how hero trucks are usually used, like this one here, controlling the scene of an accident afterwards. We got traffic backed up in both directions, and this is what it looks like when a hero truck crashes after a police chase. You can see it loaded on the back of that trailer over there. A Georgia State Patrol spokeswoman says this is 19-year-old Vandale Fluker of Decatur being pulled out of a hero unit and arrested. He found himself in handcuffs, according to GSP, after stealing the truck and leading police on a five-mile chase. This man watched it come to an end. When it came out to the expressway, the, the Georgia State Patrol swerved out and, and made a hard swerve in and hit him, and it was over with. The chase began as Atlanta police investigated a crash before 1.30 on the north end of the connector and ran the names of everyone involved. GSP reports officers noticed an outstanding arrest warrant for Fluker and he ran. Nearby, he found a hero unit left running as is standard, according to GSP, when the unit's operator is helping a driver. GSP says Fluker jumped in, the operator tried stopping him, would be dragged a short distance, and left with minor injuries. APD then radioed to GSP, who handled the chase. Georgia State Patrol saying along the way, Fluker slammed into several patrol cars. We have at least seven 
right now um, that have damage to try to, you know, stop this. Um, it, he was driving extremely reckless, high rates of speed, ramming anybody they could. Lieutenant Stephanie Stalling says GSP used several pit maneuvers to try to stop the chase, but those would be unsuccessful. When a trooper laid down stop sticks to attempt to blow out the truck's tires, Fluker allegedly swerved at the trooper. The chase eventually came to a rest on Columbia Drive near I-20 without any major injuries. It's extremely fortunate. The, the size of those trucks, they're commercial vehicles. They have a lot of weight behind them, so they can cause a lot of damage and destruction as they're being driven down the road. And Georgia State Patrol troopers tell us Fluker is on his way to the Fulton County Jail, but first he's headed to an area hospital to be checked out for any possible injuries. Well, we've heard the governor say it repeatedly. Anyone who wants a COVID-19 test can get one, whether they have symptoms or not. But we're still hearing from people who say that's not the case. What our reveal investigators found when they looked into it. People who are sick, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact. With Two weeks ago, the state announced that all Georgians should get tested for coronavirus symptoms or not. The state reports more than 404,000 tests have been processed. Still, we get emails all the time from people who say they or their loved one wants a test but can't. Reveal investigator Brendan Keefe set out to see if anyone who wants a test really can get one. What's that? Have you registered yet? Yes, I uh, have a reservation number here. My test for the COVID-19 virus is waiting in this Alpharetta parking lot, but the road to get here was paved with denials, delays, and dollars. It's a vicious cycle. Call here, call here, call here, call here. That was mid-March. I'm calling to see how I could get tested for COVID-19. 
when diagnostic testing still required symptoms and recent travel to a foreign country. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. Are they telling the truth? Nope, that's false. If we're not testing people with symptoms, we don't have a handle on just how serious and widespread this is? Absolutely. Um, I don't think the numbers that are being reported can even reflect what's really going on if everyday people can't get tested. Governor Kemp changed all that two months later as the state opened more testing sites. Encouraging all Georgians, even if they are not experiencing symptoms, to schedule an appointment. I first went to the free CVS testing site at Georgia Tech. The website still pre-screens people based on symptoms, none of which I have. In all three tries over the last week, the system replied, you do not qualify for testing at this time. Let's take a closer look at the coronavirus. As we zoom in, there's that familiar shape. But let's go inside the virus to see what the diagnostic tests are actually looking for. It's these blue strands right here. This is RNA. These are the nucleic acids that are essentially the genetic fingerprint of the virus. That's not what the blood tests are looking for. Those are looking for the antibodies that your immune system produces to hunt down the virus in your body and destroy it. I was able to get antibody testing at Quest Diagnostics. The blood test has no prerequisites other than you can't be sick and you must be willing to pay $129 for the retail test. But the results 24 hours later don't tell you if you're currently infected, only that you've previously been infected and now have the antibodies. Or get a screening through the AU Health Express Care app. So I downloaded the state's app from Augusta Health and was screened for symptoms. No, I have no conditions at all. Just wanted to get the test since the governor had mentioned okay. that uh, okay. everyone should get tested. Yeah, that was the go our governor recommended. So here's, here's the thing I want you to understand. Since you're, you don't have symptoms and you're, you are in a very low risk category um, for, for having complication if you get infected, CDC guidelines do not recommend you to get a test, but you insist I can, I can register for you. However, that comes with the cost for the COVID-19 test. I see, how much How much is it? About $300 something, than what I heard. $300, okay. The governor's office insists there is no cost for COVID testing, but the nurse practitioner on the state's app suggested it's not worth it for asymptomatic Georgians. Practicing uh, social distancing, washing your hands, and those kinds of things would be very, very effective, cost effective. All right, so we're a minute and a half into the call to the Fulton County Court of Health, and it's just repeating a recording saying it's the COVID hotline. My county health department, also recommended by the governor, booked my free test for the next day, no questions asked. Okay, even though I don't have symptoms, I can get in there without a charge. All right, the results are coming back in about five days. Got it. When I got to the Alpharetta testing site Saturday morning, the parking lot was nearly empty. The National Guard not letting anyone in without a reservation. I saw only one other patient. You guys are the real heroes in this, oh. I'll tell you. The whole test was over in seconds. All right, oh, go ahead. Only five seconds, that's all okay. you can do this. One, two, three, four, five, that's it. That's all of it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Unlike the government-backed CVS testing I didn't qualify for, which returns results in minutes, I won't know if I was positive last Saturday until days later. President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, is out of prison and back home in New York City. It is one of three things you need to know right now. Cohen will serve the rest of his three-year sentence in home confinement because of the pandemic. He served about 10 months at a federal prison in New York. Cohen pleaded guilty to lying to Congress about President Trump's business in Russia, tax fraud, and campaign finance fraud. Michigan's governor, strong words for the president. This comes after he threatened to withhold federal funding if the state continues to pursue mass mail-in voting. Threatening to take money away from a state that is hurting as bad as we are right now is just uh, scary and I think it's something that is unacceptable. Now Gretchen Whitmer appeared on CBS this morning. She says the president's threats to pull funding are ridiculous. They're scary and a major distraction. The president claims mail-in ballots lead to fraud. Yesterday, he tweeted false claims that Michigan was sending absentee ballots to 7.7 .7 million voters. The president later corrected his tweet to refer to absentee ballot applications. The TSA is implementing new procedures to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 during screenings. The agency is encouraging social distancing and wearing facial covering to the checkpoints. 
The TSA also wants passengers to hold their boarding passes instead of giving them to officers. These changes and more have already started at airports across America, but they will be more widespread by the time we get to mid-June. As the country begins to come back online, there still are millions looking for guidance. Houses of worship haven't had any federal recommendations as to how they ought to reopen, but today President Trump says new guidelines are on the way. Here's Jake. As the lights come back on in businesses across the country, restaurants, gyms, and retail outlets, even bars. We've removed half our chairs in the bar, half the tables. Are getting guidance from the Centers for Disease Control. But to this point, there have been no federal recommendations for places of worship. The president and CDC reportedly at odds over the issue. I want to get our churches open, and we're going to take a very strong position on that very soon. An administration official telling NBC News the White House plans to release recommendations for churches, synagogues, and mosques in the next week to 10 days. But for now, states, or in some cases, faith leaders themselves, are mapping out the way forward. You're going to go to Walmart, Target today, let's go to church today. In some places, though, filling the pews has caused problems, like Holy Ghost Parish in Houston. This church closed down again after a priest died from COVID-19. More than 100 parishioners are in quarantine. In Palermo, California, close to 200 churchgoers may have been exposed to the virus, a congregant testing positive after attending a Mother's Day service. Millions across the nation. We're excited to be together. Trying to navigate what is a blurry line right now between faith and infection. We are starting to get a glimpse at the Metro Atlanta restaurants that were forced to buckle in during the pandemic. Governor Kemp tried to reignite the economy by being one of the first to reopen. Some restaurant owners say it did more harm than good. Here is their opinion, and our reporter is Natisha Lance. I'm struggling to try to make sense of all of this. For 10 years, Will Turner worked to make his dream happen, turning his highly successful food truck into a freestanding sit-down restaurant on Peachtree Industrial. This week, the place he filled with his passion was wiped out by COVID-19. The 10 years of, of working for something and then getting it and then to have it taken away at no fault of your own, um, that's a hard pill to swallow. The restaurant industry as a whole, uh, it's a very difficult business. When an event like this hits, it could be devastating. That was the case for one of Lucky's Burger and Brew locations in Emory Village. The virus accelerated the decline of a restaurant already struggling. When COVID hit uh, it, and they basically sent all the students home, it really became untenable over there. As of last month, nearly 6 million restaurant jobs have been lost. For small business owners struggling to pay their bills, expected relief from reopening may have hurt more. When the governor officially opened the state back up, that kind of changed the mindset of the creditors, the vendors, and the landlord. And it shifted from, we'll work with you, to uh, we need our money now. Turner says 90% of his customers worked near his restaurant. Without them fully back in the office, his seats remained empty. Tomorrow, Vice President Mike Pence will meet with restaurant executives in Atlanta. They have pressed the president to extend the deadline for spending PPP loans from eight weeks to 24. While the president called the request reasonable, it is not clear how much of an extension will be given. Unfortunately, the list continues to grow on and on and on. Many Metro Atlanta restaurants now closing or are in the process thereof. You can read the list in the As Seen on TV section of the 11 Alive app. This next story certainly is one that hits all the right notes. A sixth grader wanted to find a way to show his appreciation for Decatur medical workers through his music. He's dedicated to Hope Ford shows us this future Atlanta symphony player continued his nightly performance for almost a month straight. Twelve-year-old Jason Zagantz is a passionate young man. I'll sometimes be playing Fortnite with my friends and say, it's time to go to the hospital, bye. Jason goes to Emory Healthcare in Decatur every night, not because he's sick, but to play for healthcare workers during shift change. The one-man band comes with an impressive set list. Over the rainbow, 
America the Beautiful, My Country Tis It The. And he's lined up dedicated fans. When's the album coming out? <laughs> Robert Westmoreland can't wait for 7 p.m. when Jason stands in the middle of the hospital grounds so his music can bounce all around. It's like a vitamin, like that extra boost, like, hey, we can do it. It made me feel really good to know that I had have a fan, at least one fan. <laughs> he has more than one. With a hectic work schedule since the pandemic, workers are happy Jason is now a part of their routine. We leave, we talk about it in the lunchroom, like, hey, did you see the little guy out there playing? Even the birds join his outdoor performance. Jason will keep coming back for the foreseeable future, playing his songs of appreciation. He says, why not do something you love while sending love to those in need? It's really fun, makes people happy, and if you like doing it, then you're happy too. All right, Hope Ford reporting. Great story. Music runs in the family. Jason's father plays for the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, and his dream is one day to play in the ASO along with his father right next to him. A vacancy coming to Georgia's high court coming up by Governor Kemp gets the final say instead of voters. Still watching a few showers on radar. Not much going on here in Atlanta or in North Georgia, but we do have some showers coming out of Alabama that are moving over toward the east. Stay with us. I'll let you know if these will have any impact on us while you're trying to sleep tonight. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. Uh, Georgia Sperm Bank faced tough questions today from the state Supreme Court after a family accused it of selling sperm under false pretenses. The family says they were told the donor had multiple college degrees and a clean medical history. 
That was not the case. Neither turned out to be true. Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom says at issue now is whether the family can sue or not. Several families who purchased sperm from this donor have tried to sue. As the attorney told the Supreme Court justices, 10 judges have already dismissed these cases because in Georgia, you can't sue for wrongful birth. May it please the court. The hearing was held virtually. Justices lined up to listen as each side had 20 minutes to make their case. The, the family at the center of it all sat in their living room to watch. A sperm bank should exercise reasonable care. An issue is whether selling misrepresented sperm counts as consumer fraud or wrongful birth, a term that came out of a 1990 court case involving the Abelson family. The result, you can't sue for failure to be notified your child will be born with a defect. You say the child didn't turn out the way you wanted. How is that different from the doctor failing to diagnose your child with Down syndrome? But the issue that seemed to frustrate the justices. Your resistance is alarming. Was the idea that if this case was dismissed as a wrongful birth claim, Zytex could do or say anything about the sperm it sold and never be held accountable. Seems like because we're dealing with sperm, and we have this Abelson case, you are now exempt from all civil remedies, all theories, no matter what kind of conduct your client may have engaged in. That can't be right. 38 law professors from across the United States also filed this legal analysis, asking the justices to allow the Normans case, as well as others like it, to go to trial. It could take up to six months before we learn their decision. Elections involving Georgia's Supreme Court justices don't always get a lot of attention, but American politics is a different place these days. The topography has changed, and it is a non-election that is making headlines. Justice Keith Blackwell stepping down from the bench. This is coming in November, according to the court. The Georgia Constitution says the governor appoints the replacement. The Supreme Court stepped in because of two lawsuits, former Democratic Congressman John Barrow and former Republican State Representative Beth Beskin sued the Secretary of State claiming an election should be held. They both wanted to run for it, arguing justices should be elected, both Fulton County Superior Court and the Georgia Supreme Court. They disagreed, saying in a case like this, the governor is the one who makes the appointment. Now, we asked attorney and law professor Randy Kessler if the court got this one right. You know, it's a close call because there are two provisions. One, we want judges to be elected, but the governor has the right to appoint them when it's an expiring term. Had Blackwell resigned and said, I'm leaving now, then there would have been an election. But he said, I'm not resigning until November. But the, the short version is, I think the Supreme Court got it right. And I don't think it was political. The governor has not yet announced his pick to replace Justice Blackwell. Well, we are coming up on the Memorial Day holiday weekend, and then after that will be June 1st next week. And June 1st is the beginning of hurricane season, but as you know, we already have had a tropical storm in the Atlantic Basin, Arthur, uh, that was out off of the North Carolina coastline. And this is really the sixth year in a row that we've actually had a tropical system that has developed before hurricane season actually starts. Well, today, NOAA issued their revised or updated outlook for this year's hurricane season, and it's showing an above average season, and that kind of corresponds with some of the other outlooks that have been uh, put out earlier so far this year. But this is as of today. They've revised this a little bit, and on average, we would see about 12 named storms in the season. Again, it's from June 1st. Uh, until November 30th. Well, this year they're predicting 13 to 19 storms. Of those, six to 10 would be hurricanes, and on average we would have about six hurricanes, so that would be above average. And then as uh, major hurricanes of uh, category three or above, they're predicting three to six of those to be major, and three is the average. So overall, this is gonna be an above average season for hurricanes. Now, the one thing that we can't tell you is when these storms are gonna hit, or where they're gonna hit, or if they'll even make landfall. And it is possible that many of these can stay out in the ocean and never make landfall. So we're gonna be here with you throughout the season, the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and we'll keep you posted on any of these storms that develop there, especially the ones that could have impacts on us. You know, you don't have to live on a beach or on the coast to be impacted by hurricanes. We are uh, impacted by those here in the metro Atlanta area by the remnants of many of those storms. Right now, no rain in our area. We've been watching a few light showers over parts of North Georgia tonight. 
Also, that's around that area of low pressure uh, that is slowly moving off to the north and east. Keeping an eye on some of these showers and storms that are back into Alabama, I really think this activity is going to stay south, really along Columbus and Macon Line and southward. Earlier, some of our models were showing that this could be closer to Atlanta, but on the south side. But now it looks like that's going to stay more uh, down to the south. So I'm not really concerned about that tonight. Here's a live look. I know this looks kind of dark here, uh, but this is a live look in Athens. Just wanted to show you this. The streets are dry. We've got some cars moving along there uh, on, this, on the roads right there at North Campus and near the downtown area. Uh, so pretty nice night out there. Pretty comfortable. Now, our high today was still below average. We should be around 81 for this time of year, but we hit 75. That is 10 degrees warmer than we were yesterday when we were only at 65. So we enjoyed that warmer air today and tomorrow it is going to get even warmer. Now, I have to tell you, I was getting a little nervous about our high forecast for today because I was waiting for those temperatures to get into the 70s and it took a while. By noontime, we were at 69 at 1 o'clock 70. Then the sun started breaking through and those temperatures moved up into the mid 70s. I know this is just showing 74, but in between these hourlies, we did get up to 75 for that high temperature today. And now we're, uh, you know, kind of mild out there, still holding in the lower 70s and upper 60s. Tonight, you can see here that those showers are mainly going to stay along that, roughly along the Columbus Macon line with those moderate to more heavy showers. We're going to see a few scattered showers here in the morning and then during the day tomorrow, especially afternoon and evening, another round of showers will move through. This is the part that has the potential for some of those to turn strong tomorrow. Nothing widespread, but just any uh, isolated storms that develop, some of those could turn strong. 84 for a high Friday, and then 87 Saturday and Sunday. For the weekend, 30% chance for a shower, <coughs> excuse me, on Monday, Memorial Day, a 40% chance as we get down to 84. Mid 80s again Tuesday, and holding in the mid 80s Wednesday and Thursday with the rain chances that'll be going down as well. Stay with us, we have more to come on 11 Alive News, prime time on the ATL. It's not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
we are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough. We'll be watching a few scattered showers and thunderstorms redeveloping tomorrow. Some of those could turn strong, a high of 84. Rain chances lower Saturday and Sunday, but it's going to be warm, 87 for a high. Just a couple of scattered showers for the weekend. On Memorial Day, back to a 40% chance for showers. That lingers into Tuesday as well. And then lower rain chances Wednesday and Thursday with high temperatures. That'll be in the mid-80s into next week. Hard to believe Memorial Day weekend almost upon us. Friday is but a couple of hours away. All right, that is it for us for now. And we will see you coming up uh, in the minutes ahead right here on the Big 36 where news is king. Stay with us. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your... 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. On this Thursday tonight at 10, outrageous confrontations on social media. A look at why the debate over wearing a mask in public is causing so much controversy for so many. Some moments we have that are really good and we're like, yes, we've got this. And then others, it's like, okay, what just happened? He nearly died while protecting his community. Now, months later, back on duty. It is a miracle how Officer Matt Cooper's family helped make his hard-fought dream a reality. First tonight, a third arrest in the Ahmad Arbery murder investigation in Glynn County. The man who recorded the fatal shooting now 
jail. This comes two weeks after the arrest of the father and son, Gregory and Travis McMichael. Natisha Lance has the very latest details on the arrest. Tonight, the man behind this viral video that sparked outrage across the country arrested for murder. GBI tells us William Roddy Bryan is charged with felony murder and attempted false imprisonment. Three days ago, Bryan's attorney said his client took a lie detector test to clear his name. Mr. Bryan was not armed. He was unarmed at the time of the shooting, and he was not in communication with Gregory or Travis McMichael or anyone else during that time frame. Gregory and Travis McMichael have been charged with murder for the death of 25-year-old Ahmad Arbery. 50-year-old Brian filmed the February 23rd confrontation between the McMichaels and Ahmad Arbery after his attorney says he noticed Arbery running, followed by a white pickup truck. He says Brian was just a witness and showed police his video immediately. One of the prosecutors who previously led the investigation wrote in a memo Brian joined the McMichaels in, quote, hot pursuit of Arbery. Brian's attorney says he has been cooperative, answering police questions during a lengthy interview without a lawyer. The other big story tonight, the state vowing to do a better job when it comes to sharing data about where we stand in the battle against the coronavirus. 11 Alive's Hope Ford has more from the state capitol. Governor uh, Brian Kemp actually addressed the data reporting errors today, saying his office is committed to transparency and also asked for patience as the Department of Public Health is working to, to put all of the numbers together. Now, at one point, the governor said he's had numerous conversations with Dr. Kathleen Toomey, the rec director of the Department of Public Health, about what they need to do to make sure those numbers are reported accurately. And one idea the governor said was being tossed around was actually the idea of reporting the numbers a day later to, uh, to give staff a chance to check the numbers. So let's take a quick listen to uh, Governor Kemp and Dr. Toomey. They were addressing specific steps they're going to take to make sure that all of the data is reported correctly. But just know that every day I'm looking at a lot of different data points that we're getting. We talk about a lot of those every day. There's some things that I see that, you know, we, we don't necessarily talk about a lot. There's a lot of minutia involved in that, but it's very helpful for me to be able to follow uh, those data points. So I think people can be very confident in the decisions that we're making are based on more than just one thing. More feedback, more information, more in, in, within our agency, more communication, uh, and uh, more effort to ensure that it, these data don't just meet our, our needs as epidemiologists, but are presented in a way that the, our, that the public can use. And they're also not just looking at the data that are reported online, they're also looking at the number of hospitalizations. And uh, Governor Kemp said they reached a milestone in Georgia today. Governor Kemp said that there are now less than 1,000 hospitalizations across the state, and that's a drop of about 40% since May 1st. Despite its groundbreaking work on COVID-19, Emory is now facing a $660 million revenue shortfall. That is why the state's largest health care system will be furloughing 1,500 workers. That's according to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Most of those losses are due to the number of non-emergency surgeries and other procedures put on hold by the COVID-19. Those totals exceed the $142 million Emory received from the Federal CARES Act. Furloughs, reduced work hours, and other cost cutting measures will begin on June 1st. It's the last one masks that have become a flashpoint, leading to some really tough confrontations. Let's go, and I'm asking this member to put on a mask because that is our company policy. So either wear the mask. And I'm not doing it because I woke up in a free country. We live in America. Where if you have a you, you have a note to not wear a mask, look at this. Viral videos showing people angry, refusing to put on the mask, even if it's a store's policy. They accuse their rights being prohibited, their constitutional rights. That is not true. So we post uh, we post the question on our 11 Alive Facebook page. Are you wearing a mask or are you against it? The post blew up. More than 2,000 of you commenting. What is your take on it? Yes or no to a mask? You can vote right now in our live interactive poll on 11alive.com slash vote or on the 11 Alive app. 30,000 lives, that's how many could have been saved had the U.S. went on a lockdown a week earlier, according to a new study from Columbia University. As nearly every state in the country starts to ease restrictions and begin to open their economies back up. Experts warn the virus could easily come back if people let down their guard. Here's Ryan Kruger with the story. 
In a desperate race to try to slow the spread of the coronavirus, states across the country started enacting stay-at-home orders in the middle of March. But by then, it was too late, according to a new study from Columbia University. More than 90,000 Americans have died as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, but that new research suggests a third of those lives could have been saved had the nation acted just one week earlier. The federal government waited far too long to start mobilizing response. We had a good lead on this virus that we just let evaporate. The study's authors say social distancing has played a huge role in slowing the spread of the virus, but it also shows how quickly the virus can gain traction. Dr. Brian Castrucci, the CEO of the public health group De Beaumont Foundation, says as states reopen, it's up to citizens to be proactive in slowing the spread. Things like wearing a mask, continuing to social distance, and practicing good hygiene. Uh, if we don't follow some safety precautions, uh, it will come back and it will come back hard. The White House says that President Trump's decision to restrict travel back in March helped slow the spread of the virus. The study's authors point out that social distancing only works if everyone is participating. Otherwise, we risk another outbreak. President Trump on the road in Michigan today visiting a Ford plant that has found a new life, a new purpose. It comes amid a growing debate over wearing the mask. The president weighing in today also Today, new unemployment figures show close to 40 million Americans have filed first-time jobless claims since the coronavirus crisis began. Here's NBC's Alice Barr in D.C. President Trump visiting Michigan today, touring a Ford plant that's shifted gears to produce ventilators, a symbol of the battered American economy in transition. The president saying he would not shut the country down again if there's a second wave of coronavirus cases. We're going to put out the fires. We're not going to close the country. The visit comes against the backdrop of an increasingly heated national debate over wearing masks. One question ahead of this trip, whether the president would wear a mask in public for the first time or go against Michigan state orders and Ford plant policy. Well, I did wear, I had one on before. I wore one in this back area but I didn't want to give the press the pleasure of seeing it. President Trump later holding up his mask. Here's my mask right here. And I liked it very much. I actually, honestly, I think I look better in the mask. Ford's top executive deferring to the president. It's up to him. The president and his supporters pointing out he's tested for coronavirus more than any other American. In fact, I was tested this morning. President Trump's visit to Ford, an American manufacturing icon, coming as unemployment figures out today show another unnerving dip. 2.4 million Americans filed new jobless claims last week, bringing the nine-week total to more than 38 million claims. The weekly toll is leveling off, but still represents vast numbers of people who may not get their jobs back. With all 50 states now reopened to some degree, the focus everywhere is on striking a balance between economic and public health. According to the CDC, coronavirus is not easily spread by touching surfaces. The agency released new guidelines. They say, yes, it is possible to get the virus by touching a surface, but it's not the main way. However, the CDC says there still is a lot to learn about the virus, and the best form of protection is still social distancing and uh, washing your hands and wearing a mask. Chris? We are watching the development of some additional showers and thunderstorms tomorrow. The Storm Prediction Center has parts of North Georgia in the level one of five risk. Stay with us. We're going to break down the timing for you. For you, get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you 
First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but According to the CDC, the coronavirus is not easily spread by touching surfaces, the agency releasing new guidelines. They say, yes, it is possible. You can get the virus by touching a surface, but it is not the central way. However, the CDC says there still is a lot to learn about COVID-19 and the best form of protection still social distancing. Wash your hands a bunch and make sure that you wear a mask. But as states relax social distancing guidelines, one area people are still very hesitant to visit is public restrooms. Our sister station in Houston tells us why. As more and more states open up and businesses do the same, there's one stumbling block being reported, public restrooms. Let's connect the dots. As the public gets out and about more, it's just a fact of life that people need to use restrooms. But most people report not feeling comfortable using them yet. And this means businesses are having to adjust, not just the fixtures in their bathrooms, but also the employees they hire. According to the Washington Post, restaurants are now looking for more than just chefs and waiters, also bathroom monitors. The job involves not just keeping the space clean, but also ensuring customers wait their turn at a safe distance. McDonald's is now requiring franchisees to clean their bathrooms every 30 minutes. And that appears to be a common trend in the restaurant business these days. The people who make bathroom fixtures have seen a surge of requests, not just from restaurants, but other businesses as well. There's a huge demand for touchless features in copper, which has antimicrobial properties. Those high powered hand dryers are falling out of favor though, thanks to concerns about blowing germs around. And experts say these changes are probably not temporary as concerns over cleanliness in public restrooms was a thing even before the pandemic. Mainly dry weather conditions out there for tonight. We have some clouds in some spots and we've had a couple of spotty light showers over far north Georgia and those are pretty much staying in North Georgia, not really moving into our area. Still watching low pressure up to the north. Most of the heavier rain is in the Carolinas. Just a few scattered showers in Tennessee. Those won't impact us. We've been keeping a close eye on these showers and thunderstorms with a good coverage of lightning with this through parts of Alabama, just north of Montgomery, also south of Montgomery. But it looks like now our earlier models were indicating that some of these showers could move just south of I-20, but now it looks like most of this is going to stay really along the Columbus and Macon line and southward. I think that's where they'll have most of the moderate showers and even that thunder and lightning. So here's a look at that updated forecast track, and that shows it again between Columbus and Macon, those more moderate to heavy showers in that area. South of I-20, there will be a few scattered showers here, but nothing really major. So just know for the nighttime hours, you should be able to sleep okay. Early in the morning, we'll begin to see a little more moisture and some of those scattered showers that'll redevelop here in the metro area. And then later morning in the early afternoon, showers and storms rolling through parts of far north Georgia. And it is possible that some of those could turn severe. The Storm Prediction Center has North Georgia in the green color, which is the marginal risk or level one of five risk for some isolated, stronger storms. We don't think it's going to be widespread, but some of those showers that develop could have some damaging winds with them, lightning, maybe even some small hail that could trigger a couple of severe thunderstorm warnings. Again, we don't think it's going to be widespread. Not everybody's going to be getting that, but just some isolated activity out there that could be strong. We got up to 75 degrees for a high today. That was compared to the 65 that we had yesterday, but 75 is still a little bit below the average. And right now we're at 68. We do have a pretty uniform temperatures all around. We do have some cooler spots like in Covington, we're at 61, Athens is 64, even 59 in Clayton, but most places 
are in the 60s at this hour. And we'll see these temperatures falling through the 60s overnight, bottoming it out in the lower 60s. And some of those showers early in the morning when Chesley's going to be uh, monitoring that rain for you early in the morning for morning, morning rush. We're going to go with the 6 on the wisometer. That's our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. High temperatures tomorrow up to 84 degrees. That's even warmer than it was out there for today. And that's going to be above average for this time of year. Here's the timing in the morning. A few of those scattered showers that we're going to have around. Maybe a break at noontime with showers up on the north side. And then scattered activity in the afternoon as well as in the evening. And as I mentioned, it's not widespread, but just some of those isolated showers could have uh, some heavier activity with it in the form of some uh, damaging winds possible. So 40% chance for a shower Friday, 30% chance Saturday and Sunday. Look at those temperatures, though, how they warm up to 87 degrees in the afternoon hours here on Saturday and Sunday. So that's going to be really warm, feeling kind of summer-like for the weekend. On Monday, Memorial Day, back to a 40% chance for showers, as well as on Tuesday, highs around 84. Rain chances coming down to 30% Wednesday, 20% on Thursday, with high temperatures in the mid-80s into much of next week. Here's your weather wow moment of the day. Cleanup is underway after strong storms move through parts of South Carolina. Look at this video from the Johns Island area. Dozens of trees were uprooted, including this one, which fell on and through a house. Thankfully, no one there was injured. There were also reports of hail and flooding. You know, a lot of parts of South Carolina and North Carolina had some flooding. The National Weather Service is gonna survey the damage left behind and they'll determine whether or not a tornado was to blame for that activity there in uh, South Carolina. We'd love for you to be a part of our weather wow moment. We get a lot of those from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can be a part of that group uh, just on Facebook. Search 11 Alive Storm Trackers in the search bar, and you'll see the group there. I ask to become a member. We'll let you in, and you can be a part of this exclusive local weather community. All right, Chris, thank you. Governor Kemp today underscored how he continues to base his decisions on reopening the state on the best health data and advice from medical professionals and science as well. Even now, there are voices of concern. They continue to caution all of us to be grateful for positive signs, but also to go slow. Georgia State's Dr. Harry Hyman talked with us today. Here's John Chirik. Preliminary good news on the one hand, cases remaining steady, hospitalizations down, balanced on the other hand with medical concerns still about reopening smart. I'm still very concerned. Dr. Harry Hyman with Georgia State University School of Public Health says from his medical perspective, it will be another couple of weeks before we will know the impact of Georgia's first steps in reopening. There's pressure now to show that things are really okay in spite of our having reopened our state. Dr. Hyman points to evidence of improving numbers statewide, but not yet, for example, in five metro Atlanta counties, specifically in Fulton, DeKalb, Cobb, Gwinnett, and Clayton. All of those really um, haven't come down from their peak. I mean, it's flattening, but, but not coming down. He says he's still cautious because the state is saying that its containment strategy won't even be fully in place until mid to late June. That's the public health infrastructure that needs to be in place before you start opening things up, not, not kind of on the fly um, as you've opened things up. But as the state does reopen, he says it's more important than ever for people to take the pandemic seriously and not let down their guard. Coming up next, a little boy asked for a FedEx driver's help to deliver something special, a present to his sporting idol. How one man's act of kindness led to a big surprise. I just thought it Money dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation. It was a thoughtful idea, but a real long shot. A FedEx driver in Georgia wanted to help out a little boy in Sewanee connect with an athlete he looks up to. It all turned out bigger and better than he had hoped. Here's Elvin Lopez. Mikkel tells me he just joined TikTok a few months ago to keep a watchful eye on his 12 year old daughter's account. He says he didn't expect to get the following he currently has, much less to make a huge impact on a young boy's life. Hello, hello. What's up, guys? How are you? Tony. What? Hey, you got, how do you guys, are you living in a sideways world? That's crazy. <laughs> Camera upside down and all. Six year old Cooper and his nine year old brother Tucker are meeting their idol skateboard legend Tony Hawk for the first time. Here's my skate park. Dude, you're lucky. You're lucky. None of this would have been possible if it weren't for one person. It started with Cooper and uh, Mikhail was the was the glue. On Tuesday, Mikhail Farrar was in Swanee on his delivery route for FedEx. I'm about to make a turn and I see this little boy running behind my truck and all of a sudden I hear, excuse me, excuse me. And I'm like, what is that? It was six year old Cooper. He wasn't even wearing shoes, nothing. He just ran him down the street. All Cooper wanted was to get his old skateboard to his idol. Hey, sir, do you know the pro skater Tony Hawk? I was like, yeah, I know who he is. And he goes, can you mail this to him? And this is what it was. He says, get this to Tony Hawk for me. Uh, tell him it's from Cooper and I just thought it was adorable. That TikTok video posted by Mikkel made its way to Hawk. People were tagging me and texting me and they're like, you gotta see this video, you gotta see this video. And he responded with one of his own. Hey Cooper, what's up, it's Tony Hawk and I just wanna say thank you so much for the skateboard. It's on its way to my house already and uh, as a thank you gift, I'm gonna send you my skateboard, this one right here that I'm riding. Today, not only did Cooper get his skateboard, but Hawk also made sure his brother got one too. But Cooper, you didn't really expect me to send you anything, did you? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, you did? Oh, you well, did? I stand corrected. <laughs> Mikkel says even though he's been making deliveries in Cooper's neighborhood of Swanee for over two years, that they had not really met until now. And as you can imagine, they've become fast friends. Elwin, Mikkel is really the center point of this whole story. It wouldn't have happened if he hadn't taken a moment to maybe remember what it was like to be Cooper's age and what this all would have meant to him. We actually spoke about that and about the power of social media nowadays. He says his idol at the time was Michael Jordan, and at the time he would have done anything to get a pair of sneakers from Jordan. I love it. Elwin, of course, the story will be on 11alive.com so people can share it. Thanks a lot. All right, we've heard the governor say it repeatedly. Anyone who wants a COVID-19 test can get one, whether they have symptoms or not. But we're still hearing from people who say that's not the case. After the break, what our Reveal investigators found when they looked into it. Every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, uh, Georgia Sperm Bank faced tough questions today from the state Supreme Court after a family accused it of selling sperm under false pretenses. The family says they were told the donor had multiple college degrees and a clean medical history. Neither turned out to be true. Here's Reveal investigator Rebecca Lindstrom, and she says right now the issue is whether the family can sue or not. Several families who purchase sperm from this donor have tried to sue. As the attorney told the Supreme Court justices, 10 judges have already dismissed these cases because in Georgia, you can't sue for wrongful birth. May it please the court. The hearing was held virtually. Justices lined up to listen as each side had 20 minutes to make their case. The family at the center of it all sat in their living room to watch. A sperm bank should exercise reasonable care. An issue is whether selling misrepresented sperm counts as consumer fraud or wrongful birth, a term that came out of a 1990 court case involving the Abelson family. The result, you can't sue for failure to be notified your child will be born with a defect. You say the child didn't turn out the way you wanted. How is that different from the doctor failing to diagnose your child with Down syndrome? But the issue that seemed to frustrate the justices. Your resistance is alarming. Was the idea that understand. if this case was dismissed as a wrongful birth claim, Zytex could do or say anything about the sperm it sold and never be held accountable. Seems like because we're dealing with sperm and we have this Abelson case, you are now exempt from all civil remedies, all theories, no matter what kind of conduct your client may have engaged in. That can't be right. 38 law professors from across the United States also filed this legal analysis asking the justices to allow the Normans case, as well as others like it, 
to go to trial. It could take up to six months before we learn their decision. President Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, out of prison, back home in New York City. One of the three things you need to know on this Thursday night. Cohen will serve the rest of his three-year sentence in home confinement because of the pandemic. He served about 10 months at a federal prison in New York. Cohen pleaded guilty to lying to Congress about President Trump's business in Russia, tax fraud, and campaign finance fraud. Michigan's governor upset with the president. This comes after he threatened to withhold federal funding if the state continues to pursue mass mail-in voting. But threatening to take money away from a state that is hurting as bad as we are right now is just uh, scary and I think is something that is unacceptable. Governor Gretchen Whitmer appeared on CBS this morning. She says the president's threats to pull funding are ridiculous, scary and a major distraction. The president claims mail-in ballots led to fraud. Yesterday, he tweeted false claims that Michigan was sending absentee ballots to 7.7 .7 million voters. The president later corrected his tweet to refer to absentee ballot applications. The TSA implementing new procedures to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19 during screenings. The agency encouraging social distancing and wearing facial coverings to the checkpoints, also known as a mask. The TSA also wants passengers to hold their boarding passes instead of giving them to officers. These changes and more have already started at airports across the country, but will be more widespread by mid-June. Lori Laughlin and her husband plead guilty to conspiracy charges. They will serve time in jail. The couple facing charges in connection with a college admissions bribery scheme. They're accused of lying to get their daughter into the University of Southern California as an athlete. According to NBC, they will plead guilty to conspiracy to commit mail fraud and wire fraud. Laughlin will serve a couple of months in jail. Her husband gets five. According to prosecutors, they will be the 23rd and 24th parents to plead guilty in the case. There's a wild chase on the connector today after somebody stole a hero unit. Joe Hankey has the very latest near, De near Decatur. Well, this is how hero trucks are usually used, like this one here, controlling the scene of an accident afterwards. we got traffic backed up in both directions, and this is what it looks like when a hero truck crashes after a police chase. You can see it loaded on the back of that trailer over there. A Georgia State Patrol spokeswoman says this is 19-year-old Vandale Fluker of Decatur being pulled out of a hero unit and arrested. He found himself in handcuffs, according to GSP, after stealing the truck and leading police on a five-mile chase. This man watched it come to an end. When they came out to the expressway, the, the Georgia State Patrol swerved out and, and made a hard swerve in and hit him, and it was over with. The chase began as Atlanta police investigated a crash before 1.30 on the north end of the connector and ran the names of everyone involved. GSP reports officers noticed an outstanding arrest warrant for Fluker and he ran. Nearby, he found a hero unit left running as is standard, according to GSP, when the unit's operator is helping a driver. GSP says Fluker jumped in, the operator tried stopping him, would be dragged a short distance and left with minor injuries. APD then radioed to GSP who handled the chase. Georgia State Patrol saying along the way, Fluker slammed into several patrol cars. We have at least seven right now um, that have damage to try to, you know, stop this. Um, he was driving extremely reckless, high rates of speed, ramming anybody they could. Lieutenant Stephanie Stalling says GSP used several pit maneuvers to try to stop the chase, but those would be unsuccessful. When a trooper laid down stop sticks to attempt to blow out the truck's tires, Fluker allegedly swerved at the trooper. The chase eventually came to a rest on Columbia Drive near I-20 without any major injuries. It's extremely fortunate. The, the size of those trucks, they're commercial vehicles. They have a lot of weight behind them, so they can cause a lot of damage and destruction as they're being driven down the road. And Georgia State Patrol troopers tell us Fluker is on his way to the Fulton County Jail, but first he's headed to an area hospital to be checked out for any possible injuries. Illegal street racing in Atlanta has become a big-time problem. Over the weekend, a, a citywide operation led to the arrest of 44 people and impounding of 29 cars. But now now the mayor is exploring ways this can be done legally and safely. During today's city council meeting, the mayor announced the city is looking to identify designated areas or streets specifically for drag racing. We'll see how that goes. She says she understands the culture behind racing and even says a possible venue could be the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Still, that needs to be vetted. But according to Mayor Bottoms, there's more to it than just picking a location. If we were able to find a location, what the liability would be, what the parameters would be. So I don't even know if that's going to be an option, but it's just one thing that we're benchmarking and, and looking to see if, um, if that's something that would help 
alleviate it, but it would not be in anyone's neighborhood or on any public streets, I can assure you of that. The move is still under consideration. For now, street racing in Atlanta is still very illegal, and Atlanta police will continue to arrest anybody they believe is involved. Tomorrow, Officer Matt Cooper is his day in Georgia, and his loved ones feel it should be every day should be his because he fought way back from uh, from being shot in the head some 20 months ago, and now he's back on the force. Caitlin Ross reports on a recovery his family is calling miraculous. I was, I was very excited to get ready to get back into the work field because it's out of that therapy setting. Officer Matt Cooper has been on a grueling physical therapy schedule for the past 20 months. Learning how to walk, talk, and speak again has been difficult, to say the least. So when he was finally cleared to go back to work, his wife Kristen says she was scared but excited for him. Just so happy, so I couldn't be anything but happy. She's thrown herself into researching traumatic brain injuries since he was shot in the head in the line of duty a year and a half ago. And even she can't believe his progress. He shouldn't be able to do what he's doing. I mean, he was shot literally between the eyes. The couple works together to learn how to navigate his recovery. And I definitely think it's been a journey. I think we've had to open up our communications slightly more than like a newly married couple. Well, they say it's hard to move past the fear of what happened, they won't let his injury define them. We just try to look at everything with optimism, and if, it, if something does go wrong, we have faith that we'll still be able to get back up. The Covington Police Department is asking everyone to leave well wishes on their Facebook page for Officer Matt Cooper Day tomorrow. Caitlin, we have watched the community step up every single time we have updated the story, and Officer Cooper told you that has really been a key for him. Yes, when he was first injured, Officer Cooper says it was so hard not being able to take care of his family. But his fellow officers, friends, and family really stepped up, coming over to their house to mow their lawn, make them dinner, and just let him know they were behind him 100% in his recovery. Caitlin, thanks a lot. Governor Kemp says anyone who wants a COVID-19 test can get one, but we are still hearing from people who say the process isn't so clear cut. Coming up, our reveal investigators look into the process and found several roadblocks. We are dry in the metro area right now and over North Georgia, but we're keeping an eye on some of these showers and storms in Alabama. Some of those may clip parts of the south side. We'll talk more about that and let you know if we'll see additional showers through the weekend. Coming up, the GHSA made a huge decision. Summer workouts are resuming for student athletes. Not everybody's thrilled. We'll explain coming up next in sports. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed. Two weeks ago, the state announced that all Georgians should get tested for coronavirus symptoms or not. The state reports more than 404,000 tests have now been processed. Still, we get emails all the time from people who say they or their loved ones want to test, but they can't. Reveals Chief Investigator Brendan Keefe set out to see if anyone who wants a test really can get one. Have you registered yet, sir? What's that? Have you registered yet? Yes, I uh, have a reservation number here. My test for the COVID-19 virus is waiting in this Alpharetta parking lot, but the road to get here was paved with denials, delays, and dollars. It's a vicious cycle. Call here, call here, call here, call here. That was mid-March. I'm calling to see how I could get tested for COVID-19. When diagnostic testing still required symptoms and recent travel to a foreign country. Anybody that wants a test can get a test. Are they telling the truth? Nope, that's false. If we're not testing people with symptoms, we don't have a handle on just how serious and widespread this is? Absolutely. Um, I don't think the numbers that are being reported can even reflect what's really going on if everyday people can't get tested. Governor Kemp changed all that two months later as the state opened more testing sites. Encouraging all Georgians, even if they are not experiencing symptoms, to schedule an appointment. I first went to the free CVS testing site at Georgia Tech. The website still pre-screens people based on symptoms, none of which I have. In all three tries over the last week, the system replied, you do not qualify for testing at this time. Let's take a closer look at the coronavirus. As we zoom in, there's that familiar shape. But let's go inside the virus to see what the diagnostic tests are actually looking for. It's these blue strands right here. This is RNA. These are the nucleic acids that are essentially the genetic fingerprint of the virus. That's not what the blood tests are looking for. Those are looking for the antibodies that your immune system produces to hunt down the virus in your body and destroy it. I was able to get antibody testing at Quest Diagnostics. The blood test has no prerequisites other than you can't be sick and you must be willing to pay $129 for the retail test. But the results 24 hours later don't tell you if you're currently infected, only that you've previously been infected and now have the antibodies. Or get a screening through the AU Health Express Care app. So I downloaded the state's app from Augusta Health and was screened for symptoms. No, I have no conditions at all. Just wanted to get the test since the governor had mentioned okay. that uh, okay. everyone should get tested. Yeah, that's what the, our governor recommended. So here's, here's the thing that I want you to understand. Since you, are, you don't have symptoms, you're very, you are in a very low risk category um, for, for having complication if you get infected. CDC guidelines do not recommend you to get a test, but you insist. I can, I can register for you. However, that comes with the cost for the COVID-19 test. I see. How much, how much is it? About $300 something, than what I heard. 
$300, okay. The governor's office insists there is no cost for COVID testing, but the nurse practitioner on the state's app suggested it's not worth it for asymptomatic Georgians. Practicing uh, social distancing, washing your hands, and those kinds of things would be very, very effective, cost effective. All right, so we're a minute and a half into the call to the Fulton County Board of Health, and it's just repeating a recording saying it's the COVID hotline. My county health department, also recommended by the governor, booked my free test for the next day, no questions asked. Okay, even though I don't have symptoms, I can get in there without a charge. All right, the results are coming back in about five days. Got it. When I got to the Alpharetta testing site Saturday morning, the parking lot was nearly empty. The National Guard not letting anyone in without a reservation. I saw only one other patient. You guys are the real heroes in this, I'll tell you. The whole test was over in seconds. All right, go ahead. Only five seconds, okay? okay. You can do this. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. That's all of it? <laughs> oh, wow. Unlike the government-backed CVS testing I didn't qualify for, which returns results in minutes, I won't know if I was positive last Saturday until days later. Well, the hurricane season starts on June 1st, even though we've already had one tropical storm, Arthur, already formed out in the Atlantic before the season starts. And this is actually the sixth year that we have had an early season or preseason storm that has developed. Now, the National Oceanic and Administrative Act Association, NOAA, I'm sorry, I just stumbled through all that, um, did issue a revised update on the, uh, the uh, summary or the forecast for the National Hurricane Center from the National Hurricane Center on the potential four storms to develop coming up this season. And on average, we would have about 12 named storms. They are predicting above average with 13 to 19 storms. They on average would have six uh, hurricanes a year and they're predicting six to 10. And of those, three to six could become major hurricanes or category three or above hurricanes. And that would be on average, we would have about three of those. So all of this is showing overall an above average hurricane season. Now, the problem is we can't tell you if these are even going to make landfall yet. We won't know that until they form and actually start moving toward us. So we don't know how many of these will actually hit land, if any of them will, and which ones would be you know big ones as they come in. So just know that we're going to be following this for you very closely as we go through the hurricane season this year. It ends on November 30th, so it usually gets more active August into September is when the most active time is. But any, any, these can happen any time, though, between June and also the end of November. Not much activity with rain happening out there right now. We're watching some showers up in Tennessee, into the Carolinas, and into Virginia. But then this system out to the west, causing some showers and storms here near Montgomery. And that's moving here on the south side. This is mainly going to be from the Columbus and Macon area southward. Don't be surprised in LaGrange if y'all hear some thunder, maybe see some lightning from the distance from that. But I really think this is going to stay well to the south of us overnight. Early in the morning, there's the potential for a few scattered showers that will be developing around metro Atlanta, but those won't be strong. 75 for a high today. Our average high for this time of year is 81, so we are 6 degrees below the average today. No rain, uh, and our surplus is just under 13 and a half inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So here's a look at the temperature for today. This is what was happening, and I have to tell you, I mentioned earlier I was getting a little concerned with our high temperature forecast getting back into the 70s today. Uh, because by 1 o'clock, we were still in the uh, 60s with a good coverage of clouds. But once those clouds broke up some to allow some sun to come through, we bumped up into those 70s where our high was 75 in between those hourlies right there. Tomorrow, it's going to be even warmer into the mid-80s at about 84 degrees. So that warm-up continues. Now, we're going to see uh, the potential for some scattered showers to develop in our area tomorrow. And even parts of North Georgia are under this level one risk, a one of five risk for the potential for a couple of isolated storms that could have some damaging winds with them. We don't think it's going to be widespread. There will be a lot of dry hours tomorrow. And even on the weekend, a lot of dry hours too, just a 30% chance for some afternoon scattered showers. And look at the heat, 87 for a high Saturday and Sunday, 84 on Monday with a 40% chance for showers. And then the rain chances go down a little bit Wednesday and Thursday with high temperatures still in the mid 80s. Sports on this Thursday night. Today, the GHSA voted to allow schools to resume sports activities beginning on June 8th at the discretion of the individual school system. 
Some are happy, others are not, saying it should be sooner. Here's Alex Glaze telling us how athletic directors and coaches are reacting. For people like me, and I think there's a whole lot more like me than probably other, this is like Christmas. I mean, you, you've basically told us Santa is coming June the, you know, June the 8th. The Georgia High School Association Board of Trustees has approved a plan to allow school facilities to open up. While the GHSA has put out a set of guidelines that must be followed, districts have the option to be more stringent than those guidelines if they choose. Safety is the top priority. I think that people are going to look at the criteria and decide what is best for their student athletes and for their staff to make sure that you know we're providing a safe environment to resume. Now the June 8th date that was agreed upon is one week later than the original June 1st date that was supposed to be voted on. Some on the GHSA board felt the extra week was necessary. It wasn't giving schools a lot of time to make sure that they had all their procedures in place. But not everyone is thrilled to have to wait a little longer. The, the, the tone of my, my, my tweet was certainly not in any way to demean the GHSA. It was kind of to say, I think everybody's ready to go. So here is a look at some, not all of the guidelines for schools to follow. Athletics will be asked and athletes about their health and exposure to COVID-19. Workout groups will be limited to 20 consistent athletes at a time. There can't be any more than that. And there will be a lot of time and resources for disinfecting. There's going to be a lot of cleaning up. To read more, we've got all the details for you at 11alive.com. Legendary UGA player and former Auburn coach Pat Dye has been diagnosed with coronavirus. His family announced today he's 80. Great concern for him. He contracted the virus while at the hospital for kidney-related issues. According to his son, his family says they expect him to be out of the hospital soon. That is good news, and we wish him all the best. An outstanding coach and man at Auburn and the University of Wyoming a long time ago. And I've done a number of charity events with him over the years. Good guy. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. Hello, my name is Michael Mezio. I'm the athletic director at Riverwood High School. So ultimately, I want to thank the class of 2020 uh, for all their hard work and their dedication for Riverwood Athletics. We were having a fantastic year at Riverwood High School. It was looking pretty good for them to have a number of region champions. I started as a, a basketball coach in those situations it was like all about competition but as athletic director i realized that community was is really what it's about our students sticking together sticking with their community with the help of coaches sometimes zoom senior nights and uh, banquets and then once you know the shelter in place was lifted the, the seniors realized it was more about community than competition as well and they organized some you know unofficial meetings, of course, practicing social distancing, just to get together with their teammates. That's why sports are so important. The life skills it teach, the, the relationships that the students build, and the fact that they continue to carry that on, it really does make you proud. Or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. 
the things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. Cancer won't wait. It won't wait for a convenient time or for appointments to open up. That's why at Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we aren't waiting. We're right here in Atlanta, still focused on the only thing we do, providing world-class cancer care all under one roof. Because cancer isn't just what we do, it's all we do. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Call now for an appointment. If you want to do a little fishing, you don't buy a yacht. And if you want to take a bath, you just fill up the tub, not a swimming pool. So if you don't use your cell phone that much, why pay for more than you need? For as low as $20 a month, you can get talk, text, and data from Consumer Cellular with no contract and connections on the nation's largest wireless networks. It's easy to switch. Activation is free. And if you like, you can even keep your phone and number. You'll also receive award-winning customer support. Consumer Cellular has received the J.D. Power Award for highest customer service eight times in a row. And you get a simple, easy to understand bill with no surprises. Plus, they've been an approved AARP provider for over 10 years, so members get exclusive discounts. Start saving with Consumer Cellular. You can get talk, text, and data for as low as $20 a month. Switch today with our 30-day guarantee. It's 100% risk-free. Call 1-800-467-7159. Go online or find us at Target. When America needed us to build, we built. Masks, ventilators, shields. When frontliners needed support, Ford dealers answered. And now we're open and ready to serve you. With special offers like 0% financing for 72 months across the Ford lineup. Stop by a Ford dealership or go online. We've made it safer to shop, easier to buy. Now get 0% financing for 72 months across the Ford lineup. Contact your Ford dealer or stop by today. Endurance wants to get you back on the road again, America. Protecting our employees and customers is our top priority, especially in these trying times. Even if you're driving less right now and your car is sitting idle, having the right vehicle protection is just as important as ever. Plus, cars are more prone to mechanical issues when they sit unused for long periods of time. Rest assured, we're here for you every step of the way. To learn more about our limited time relief program, including $300 off any protection plan, call now or visit EnduranceWarranty.com. Experience the truth and power of grace for your everyday life with teacher and pastor Creflo Dollar. God is never going to be bankrupt. God has never been bankrupt. And now it's time for men to understand that your supply comes from him. Be inspired and receive encouragement through the word of God. But when you encounter Jesus, he'll set you free to be who you are. Don't miss the changing